Vogel Foundation was born in 2014 by David S. Vogel and Thais Lopez Vogel. David is one of the top predictive modelers in the field of quantitative finance. He and his wife wanted to create a foundation to accelerate climate solutions, enhance education, and improve health. Thais is an attorney, and as a mother of six, she wants to preserve the quality of life for our future generations. Volos Foundation's team developed and analyzed historical data sets. They combed through published energy reports to predict future outcomes of climate change. The evidence shows that as oceans warm, hurricanes will become longer and stronger. Our data scientists suggest that by 2035, we will reach the next one degree of Fahrenheit warming. Climate change is not only an environmental issue, it is a threat to our health, to our agriculture, real estate, tourism, and the economy. Climate change is a threat to our state. We at the Volo Foundation exist to be the bridge between the scientific community and everyday people. To learn more, visit volofoundation.org. We know the problem. We know who caused it. We are the problem, but also the solution. As humans, we have the capacity to adapt, so change is possible. Climate change is a place for tremendous opportunities. Let's work together. We know the facts. Let's learn the solutions. Welcome to Climate Correction, our Florida Climate Week keynote event. Welcome to Climate Correction 2021. I'm David S. Vogel. And I'm Thais Lopez Vogel. Together, in 2014, we created Volo Foundation, a private nonprofit organization with a mission to drive climate action by supporting science-based solutions, enhancing education and health. Today's keynote event brings together the world's leaders in climate action. You will hear from speakers who are working to tackle the greatest challenges facing humanity in the battle against climate change and the solutions available today to create a more renewable, sustainable future for us all. We are excited to welcome international singer-songwriter Maye to help us open Climate Correction 2021. Born in Venezuela, una venezolana como yo, and raised in Miami, she is a rising bilingual artist known for her hit songs, My Love, Tu, and Yours. Maye is with us today to share a special song she wrote called Estados Unidos to highlight this event as we explore climate solutions and our individual roles in bringing about change for the health of the planet. Hi, my name is Maye and the song that I'm performing today is an original song titled Estados Unidos. And I wanna thank you all so much for allowing me to be able to perform to those of you who are in the front lines of this climate change crisis. Thank you so much and I hope you enjoy it. Every day we live in There's an opportunity To make all the difference In community Breathe in every moment Rise each time we fall Moving with the motions Never thinking small Todos nuestros sueños 
y lo que queremos se realiza. Aquí estoy, aquí estamos, es todos unidos que avanzamos. Here we are, moving forward, growing stronger, all together. Well, good morning, everyone, or good afternoon, depending upon what time you're tuning in. Welcome to the Climate Correction Conference and today's special seminar on soil health. My name is Ernie Shea. I am the president of Solutions from the Land, and I have the pleasure of moderating today's session. Our organization is a farmer-led body that is working to help agricultural landscapes all across the country and, in fact, around the world deliver solutions to global challenges. And many of you probably have heard about these challenges in the form of the Sustainable Development Goals adopted by the United Nations in 2015. These are very ambitious. The world is seeking to end hunger, eliminate poverty, solve the climate crisis. And what we have come to realize is these goals cannot be attained without solutions from agricultural landscapes. And that requires really an all tools approach to delivering these solutions. So when we think about how agricultural lands can be enabled to provide these outcomes, we're thinking about multiple pathways. And our next slide shows what some of those are, where you think about trying to simultaneously sustainably intensify production to feed a population in the world that's going to exceed 10 billion people by 2050, we have to do it in a very uh, resilient way because of the shocky climate conditions that are changing so rapidly. And at the same time, we need to be managing our agricultural lands to deliver improvements in climate uh, services like reducing greenhouse gas emissions. So as we work with farmers and ranchers and forest landowners, each landscape is different. But the one common denominator that they all have is the soil that sustains these operations. And that's what we're going to be talking about today, the terrestrial resource base and the opportunity that we can use to manage our soils in a way to deliver these outcomes. So with us today is a technical expert that's going to walk us through everything you want to know about soil health and hopefully will stimulate more questions. We have Ray Archulata with us today. Ray is a retired agronomist, now a rancher, and he has been working on soil health issues for decades, uh, going back to my days with the local soil and water conservation districts, I remember listening to Ray give talks about soil health. So Ray, with no further ado, let's turn it over to you and learn about how managing our soils can deliver multiple outcomes to sustainable development goals like climate change. Ray? Thank you, Ernie. Today I'm gonna talk about an incredibly important subject. It's called biomimicry, mimic life emulate intelligent design. It is a premise where we emulate nature, work with it. It's a type of agriculture that is healing and a forgiveness agriculture. What I was taught in school was to force, to manipulate, to force nature to yield. It was about yield and I approached her chemically and physically. That type of premise of agriculture led to this. It led to destruction in the land. As you can see in this little video clip, this is still occurring in 2019. This has happened in Texas. 1930s, our agency, NRCS, Soil Conservation Service, was designed to stop this. It's still occurring throughout the country. Even in 2021, this is still occurring. This happened in March, where we have large amounts of soil being destroyed distributed throughout the country. 
it's still a major problem. One of the things as you fly across this country, I'll never forget when I took this slide in 2008, you can see that the land is scarred and that a majority of, of the sediment is still filling our rivers and lakes. In fact, according to the EPA, sedimentation erosion is still the number one water quality problem in the country. This is still occurring even though we've been doing this for 85 years of conservation and plus and spent billions of dollars. Many have talked about global warming, global warming. Yes, that's occurring. They always seem to focus on the effect, but the real problem, the real issue is global ignorance, global disconnectness. A majority of the people are disconnected from the land. I also was very disconnected, very ignorant about how the soil worked. As this slide shows, the soil is naked, naked because it doesn't have the plant covering. It is hungry because it doesn't have the plant to feed it and feed the microbes and the biology. Thirsty because, because the soil is bare, there's more sensible heat and latent heat, creating these hot plumes, pushing the rain clouds away. Running a fever, most people do not understand the best way to regulate temperature in the soil is a living plant. We have millions and millions of acres, miles of land that are not covered. You could see in this slide, hot soil temperatures in, in Africa, in, in North America, India, South uh, Australia, huge soil temperatures increase over 130 some degrees, creating sensible heat, disrupting the local water cycle. This is a major problem as you can see by this slide. This is not only occurring, but is occurring everywhere globally. Way too much bare soil. We have focused so much on CO2, but it, this problem is multidimensional. We don't have enough living plants on the soil surface. This degradation of the land has lead to, is leading to major issues. And for example, Farming has the highest suicide rate in a lot of the top five or 10 professions in the United States. Why such a high suicide rate? I tell farmers, you are the poorest millionaires that I know of. Why is this happening? A cause of this problem is what this slide shows is high inputs. Farmers are spending huge amounts of money on fertilizer, pesticides, all these chemicals called inputs, maintaining this huge infrastructure. Since the 1920s to 2016, look at the farm income and look at the cost of inputs. Where is that wealth going? Where is that money going to? This disruption, this economic disruption is go going to the local community. It's, it's causing a major issue. So why do we have this problem? It comes back to this, the mindset. There has to be a paradigm shift that needs to occur in our country. I tell people the hardest thing to heal is not the soil, but the way we think. It's our mindset, it's our heart. It's the way we perceive the world. That is the major issue that we have. That is the most difficult thing to heal on the farm and ranch before the soil heals. These are the three basic concepts that we have to do a paradigm shift to, for I to get farmers to understand. This is what I do. I tell farmers, the number one thing you have to learn is that the soil is alive. If you do not understand that, I cannot help you. It's not just farmers and ranchers, but many people, our grade schools teach that our soil is not alive. It's a growing medium. Number two, understand relationship. Everything is connected. All is one. Quantum physics teaches all is one. Theology teaches all is one. Ecology, all is one. Why is that important? Because if you do not know how everything is connected, that you'll go out there with your fertilizers and your chemicals and your tillage, you can break some of this complex webs, all this connectedness. And the last one is understanding the goal. Mimic life, emulate nature's principles and patterns. As a young farmer, I did not understand the goal. 
The goal was always to emulate life. I was not taught this in school. If this was a, had been taught to me early in my career, it would have made a huge impact in my life. The most complex ecosystem in the world is this the soil. This little video shows this water bear swimming in the soil. 25% of all global biodiversity is under the soil. It is the most complex ecosystem. So if you do massive killage, massive spraying, massive disturbance, leaving the soil bare, you hurt this elegant life. If you disrupt this elegant life, it disrupts all the other functions on the planet. It is a major problem. Need to understand soils alive. The other thing is understanding relationship, connectness, ecology. Ecology is not a hippie word. It means to study the house, the connectness of the house, how all things are intimately connected. It is really about understanding relationship our relationship to the earth and how it works. This slide depicts this complex relationships, this interconnectedness. This is a soil food web. Without these links, without this connectedness of all these creatures doing what they do, we cannot have functioning soils. We would not have life on this planet. So the more we disrupt it, the more we till it, the more we cause a, a severing of this function, the more it costs us in costly inputs. Understanding the relationship of this complex web. This is what I missed in school. Here is another thing that is a major problem that I was not taught in, in the early stages of university. The plant and soil are one. Without the plant, you have no soil biology. So without plant biology, without soil biology, we have geology. They are one. This next slide will show you that when a plant captures light energy and transforms it into chemical energy, it leaks this hundreds of compounds into the soil to feed it. This is one of the biggest problems that is happening in all of our agricultural land. We are not capturing enough sun and we're not leaking enough of this liquid sun into the soil to feed microbes. This next picture shows how, this next video shows how you're feeding these incredible biological array. These microbes multiply every 20 minutes. You can see that billions and billions excreting these powerful enzymes, taking the minerals out of the rock. So the more we leak, those exudates from the plant. It feeds these microbes and the fungi. They're the ones that bring the zinc, the minerals that we need in our bodies. The plant takes it up. The animal eats the plant. We eat the plant and the animal. We take up those nutrients. This is done biologically. This is very important and a powerful thing that must happen or we do not have life on this planet. This next slide shows what is occurring in our country. On the left, you show a typical picture in the spring. Illinois, majority of our, our country is bare, not capturing sun. The picture on the right this talks, shows Pennsylvania, a farmer using cover crops at the same time. The producer on the right understands soil function. He's capturing sun, feeding microbes, sequestering nutrients. Can you imagine going through our country and it would all be green? It would alter not only the water quality, but our human health and the soil health and planet health. It would change everything just by living, leaving the planet green during the winter and the spring. It would make a huge difference. So back to the goal. Why do I want that soil covered with an array of diverse cover crops? Because the prairie and the forest do the same. They're always covered. They both have diverse living ecosystems. They have insect habitat, plant habitat, animal habitat, a living root, capturing sun 24 seven. 
we want to emulate our agriculture must emulate this system and farmers and ranchers are doing this we want that same architecture as we capture light energy from the top look at the architecture on top and look at the architecture of the root architecture leaking all those root exudates feeding biology this is how farmers are designing cover crop mixes. We are designing cover crop mixes and planting this beautiful array, how that emulates the prairie, creating insect habitat, feeding array of biology and capturing the sun. This is exciting. This is happening throughout the country, throughout the world. So we have farmers and ranchers doing this, rolling the cover crop down and notice this nice layer of residue that has been rolled down, that's that cover crop, creating this natural skin. We're doing this on cotton. We're doing this on corn. We're doing this on soybean. We're doing this on, we're doing this on tomatoes. As you can see, we're doing this on tomatoes, vegetables. Going back into the West, this is a typical um, pecan orchard the way I grew up uh, and what I saw a majority of my life and went through college. This is what we were taught when we were raised pecans. You leave the ground bare because you don't want any vegetation competing with the pecan orchard. We didn't want that. And that's what I was taught. We are now doing this in our orchards. We are growing these beautiful elegant covers, rolling them down. Now, because we do this, now we're not using insecticide, no more fungicides. The yields of the pecans stabilize. It's absolutely beautiful to see what is occurring now by emulating nature. This is a, an orchard in Mexico where they're growing apples, growing living covers. These covers create these beautiful habitat for beneficial insects, facilitating life. We are doing this on a national scale. Now, quickly understand, as we talk about organic, organic for many years was the bastion of sustainability. They were kind of like the canary in the mine, telling farmers we're, we're doing things the wrong way. But I feel like organic has lost its way, just pretty much like the conventional. What you see in the top is an organic farm, and uh, an organic egg farm, in the bottom, you see a conventional. Notice they're both industrialized. The only difference is one is organic feed and the other one is conventional feed. I feel we have lost our way in the way our food system has gone. This is what we should have. A system where we allow the chickens to express their chickenness, to be part of the natural system and regenerative farming are heading this direction. And the public is demanding that. We're seeing not only in pasture chicken, but we also are seeing it in the way we raise our beef. In the left, you see an agriculture of no relationship, no connectedness to the animal. On the right picture, you see where we're using biomimicry, running the cattle like, uh, like buffalo, grouping them up tightly, relationship. We are raising our animals like that and picking up all the beautiful molecules and the nutrients from each living plant. The system on the left could no way create a food or a feed substrate that would match the complexity of all those plants. There's no physical possible way to create and emulate the same way. Wrapping this up and getting close to it, the last stage of here is showing how we are emulating our grazing systems by the bison or the Serengeti, moving animals in large groups where they defecate and urinate and stimulate the grass. They group up tightly because of predators. We are moving animals like this, mimicking the natural system. This was taught to me when I went to Mexico. Let me show the problem that's going on a national scale. This is a picture of Chihuahua, Mexico. This is not only Chihuahua, Mexico desert, but this is happening in New Mexico. This is happening in Texas, Oklahoma, Nevada. 
this is a global thing that's occurring in our once areas that were once grassland have become deserts. California, this is the problem. No nutrient cycling. Look at the crust on that soil. When I went to school for rain science, they told me that that picture, that shrub, that invasive will never allow grasses to ever go back there. It would never come back, that there would be no grass growing between those shrubs. I'm here to tell you, and I'm gonna show you in the next video, that that's not the case. How farmers mimicking nature have absolutely brought the deserts back into prairies. We will see that very soon. Let me give you a kind of a general idea where the Chihuahuan Desert is. I went to college right here. This is the Chihuahuan Desert. I was raised here. I'm gonna show you an operation of 600 cow-calf operation with six to 11 inches per year. And this is a fourth generation rancher. Alejandro Carrillos owns this ranch. This is La Damas Ranch. And this next video will show you how they were able to restore that ranch and bring it back into a prairie. I used to think that was a desert. Now I know, and watching this video of hope, you will see how the desert has become like a prairie. Chihuahuan Desert, the largest desert of North America. Once lush grasslands supporting bison, antelope, sheep, golden eagle, and prairie dogs. Nowadays unproductive, eroded, lifeless land. There is no water on site. There is no life on site. There is no hope on sight. But there is something going on right in the middle of the desert. A few determined to green the desert to a large scale. Yes, they are the heroes of yesterday, the vaqueros or cowboys, once legendary for taming the wild. Nowadays, our best allies to get things back on track. They are working in sync with Mother Nature, moving cattle every day using fences and water points, mimicking the migratory patterns of bison decades ago. As cattle moves, they fertilize and work the soil so life can come back once rain hits the ground. This transformation is already there, even if there are islands of grass across on the vast Chihuahuan Desert. We can replicate these successful experiences. We can fix the water cycle. We can cool this arid environment. We can create habitat for wildlife. We can keep people on the land. We are in. We are cool. We are ranchers willing to tackle desertification. Archaeologists have told us, have shown through recent digs, that Saudi Arabia was once vegetated. You see this elephant tusk? This was buried. The whole planet was once covered. It was once green. We can do that again. We can change the climate and stabilize it by making it green again. I think what's going to move this 
and is helping agriculture. And I think this is gonna be the future mantra. Let thy food be thy medicine. You see that salmon here, you'll see on the picture on the left, that's farm salmon. And this is the way the natural system does it. Look at the wild salmon, look at the color. People throughout our country are demanding better quality food. They want health. If we mimic nature and we farm the way we're supposed to, we can change and fix a lot of our medical issues and the disease issues that we have. But this must occur. We must have an absolute change in mindset. Don Campbell says it beautifully. If you want to make small changes, change how you do things. But when you want to make major changes, change how you see things. It's the way we see things is the problem. Our farms are a reflection of our understanding. We must understand that. So the more we understand, the more we understand the goal. The goal is to mimic life, to understand relationship and understand biomimicry. And I'll leave you with this last slide. And I think Dr. Gospath says it more beautifully, more elegantly than anybody on the real problem. It's titled, We Scientists Don't Know How to Do That. He says, I used to think that the top environmental problems were biodiversity loss, ecosystem collapse, and climate change. I thought with 30 years of good science, we could address these problems, but I was wrong. The top environmental problems are selfishness, greed, and apathy. And to deal with this, we need a spiritual and cultural transformation, a, a system that facilitates education, and we scientists don't know how to do that. I think that's absolutely so true and it's exciting. This is why we created Soul Health Academy to start that transformation, that spiritual and cultural transformation. And the real issue is an education issue. Thank you very much. Wow, Ray, you gave us a lot to think about there. And I think most of our participants in the seminar today, probably like you, like me, grew up thinking about soil as dirt. We didn't think of it as a living ecosystem that sustains life. And that presentation that you just gave us really helped bring this into perspective. Ray, I'm, I'm struck by the challenges that we're facing and they're, they're quantified very clearly in the world's global sustainable development goals, which call for by the year 2030, things like ending hunger, solving the climate crisis, cleaning up water, bringing back vital local economies. And listening to you talk about the soil, it strikes me that it is foundational to the success of all of these outcomes. Yep. So the, the solution is within our site. The challenge is scaling up an implementation. And as you've worked in this space for decades, Ray, mm -hmm. being almost an evangelist for change, what are some of the most effective ways to help communicate and win over, particularly farmers and ranchers that live and breathe these landscapes every day? How, what have you found to be most effective in helping them see a new way forward? Thank you, Arnia. Great question, because I tell you, uh, growing up around the agricultural community for a long time, I had these fixed filters and I had these paradigms, but the soil not being alive. And we found out that when we used these rain simulators and these soil demonstrations created that paradigm shift. I, I'm telling you, I don't think people realize that the farmers, uh, there is this social and cultural barriers on the local community. And sometimes you have to use an aha moment, a paradigm shift. And then, and farmers have to be ready for this because a lot of us, myself, we were struggling. We knew we were failing. So we were already looking. So there's a group of us that were looking and searching and we knew that there was a problem. The water wasn't getting clean. Farmers were going broke. So about what helped us was uh, using these soil demonstrations that we do 
to show how the rain simulator, that the water's running off when it's heavily tilled, those demonstrations were the best way to communicate how the soil was alive. And a shovel, just joining the contrast. I walked to the edge of the field, Ernie, and I get a shovel and I said, look how dark and beautiful it is. And look at your field, it's pale and anemic. It's what you're doing to the soil. Those basic tools were a great way of showing how to connect people back to the, to the soil. So Ray, we didn't get into this problem overnight, did we? You, you went back to the Middle East and over millennia, we've gone from lush green prairie landscapes like we think of today in parts of, of the world to deserts that are nearly dead. And coming back, talk to us a little bit about the time frame. A typical farmer, a rancher has 40 crop years to produce food, feed, fiber, uh, and at the same time, give back. Are we talking about progress that we can measure in a producer's lifespan, or is this multi-generational? How, how quickly can we regenerate and start to deliver all of these ecosystem services? Ernie, that's probably the, one of the top 10 questions I'm asked all the time across the country. How long is that going to take? First, I tell them it's a function of you. How determined? If you are very determined, we've seen great changes in the soils in three to five years. Three to five years, major changes. So you can cut inputs. We reduce farmers' inputs by 20% the first year. Just the first year. So it's a function of you. But we've seen great results in three to five years. Well, that's certainly encouraging. And if we have an opportunity to really come forward and transform agriculture in a way that not only helps the planet, but helps producers, think of how much support you can get behind a pathway that really shows benefits back to you as the individual farmer. Ray, let's talk a little bit about what's it gonna take for this to happen. Uh, you can only knock on so many doors, visit so many farms and ranches. How can we best communicate this new way forward and do it in a way that farmers can hear it and internalize it? I'm assuming there's technical assistance required, cost sharing maybe, um, but where does farmer to farmer learning and knowledge sharing come in? Uh, good question, Ernie. I, one of the things is, We've had cost share for, since the, we, in the 1930s, by the 1940s and 50s. It's helped, but it hasn't been really the answer. I think there's gonna be a shift, like I showed you with a slide, let thy food be thy medicine. The consumer is creating a great change and people are gonna keep demanding that. And that's gonna be, that's one way. And another way is this education where we can um, these communities where we build communities where farmers and ranchers can talk to each other, uh, these regenerative communities. Australia has no cost share at all, none. And their farmers are moving in that direction. How did they do that? They talk to each other. The farmers and ranchers start building community and start visiting with each other. And then they all have that same goal, the ones that get these grouped together. Nature is the template. So community the, the, I think the, the American people, by buying regenerative food, it's going to have a major factor on how we shift modern agriculture. So farmers, Ray, have traditionally over time been compensated by the stuff they produce, the corn, the beans they grow, the strawberries that they send to markets, the, uh, the animal protein products, but they haven't been paid for biodiversity, for water storage, for carbon storage. And we're starting to see emerging markets where farmers actually could be rewarded for farming in a way that produces ecosystem services. That's different, isn't it? And where, what hope do you have for that pathway? I, I think it is a beautiful way if we do it right. I'm not a big fan for paying people, farmers for carbon. And because it's too variable, it changes, it penalizes you if you have if you're not living in the right part of the country, because carbon is an energy flow and it's a cycle and it changes daily and it puts farmers, because being an ex-government employee, it has to be fair across the board. I think if we do biodiversity, a, 
a green payment where we pay, if you put a five or six way cover crop diverse, you get paid so much. If you do three way cover crop diversity, you get paid so much. Paying farmers for carbon will penalize a lot of farmers because if you live in a dry, arid environment, you will not build carbon as much as somebody that lives in Northern Iowa. It's dependent on climate, it's dependent on soil type, it's dependent on temperature. It changes daily. If you leave the ground bare, carbon goes down. If you plant a legume, carbon goes down. If you till the soil, carbon goes down. So to make it fair for everybody, make it green, green payment. That would work, make it simple. You can take a satellite imagery, boom, you're done. Show me the seed cost and everybody, it's fair for everybody across the, the globe. I think biodiversity and paying for biodiversity because the plant and the micro fix all of it. And we still get the carbon drawn out of the soil to make it fair. So I'm a big supporter of a biodiversity, a green payment. So for that to work, Ray, for a green payment to be successful and help a farmer overcome barriers, incur costs of transforming, um, the money has to come from somewhere. So what I think I'm hearing you say is it can be built into the market and the public can help participate in delivering these outcomes by helping to pay for it through the food products that they buy, as an example, if it's done in an appropriate scaled way. So market mechanisms are one way that farmers can be incentivized to transform. But I'm assuming so too government green payments. So there can be a role for public investments in these outcomes. And, and one thing too, Ernie, 60 to 70% of farmers in the United States receive government help. They already get federal aid in some way or some fashion. If we would say as a people we're committed and say, look, if you're going to participate and you're still going to get help from us, cover the soil. And I think we can get a massive mandate. I, I, there's many mechanisms that we can get this land covered would be great. That would help. So Ray, we're just about out of time, but as I've been reflecting on what you've been talking about, how the opportunity exists for farmers and ranchers and foresters to help transform these landscapes, I'm also thinking about the other people that manage landscapes, whether it's backyard gardeners, community associations that have acreage that they are responsible for, schools that have large pieces of property that perhaps school children can learn and participate in delivering solutions. So what can non-farmers do to help? One of, the, one of the best things they can do is grow their own garden, start growing their own food, start building relationship with their soil, their food, their, their and, and these organisms, start teaching the kids. And also buying regenerative food is very critical. Uh, find, find the farmers that are doing this, build a relationship with this. So teaching our kids, getting more um, personal with food and understand how important food is, food is our health. I think we can make a huge impact, Ernie, in our in our whole world. So getting relationship with food and the and and making your own garden would make a huge impact. Well, Ray, thank you so much for sharing your insight, your recommendations, your passion. Uh, if if anything I'm leaving with, it's it's a sense of hope that there are solutions right under our feet in the soil that we've taken for granted for too long. And if all of us work together, whether you're a farmer, a rancher, a forest land owner, a backyard gardener, uh, we can turn this around and bring solutions from the land to the forefront where the terrestrial resource base is valued and recognized for how it delivers foundational solutions that the world needs to survive and thrive. So thank you so much for that hopeful message. Thank you, Ernie. I've been raising cattle in Florida for 45 years. Sustainably managed grazing lands provide not only great beef, but they also provide wildlife, habitat, corridors, water filtration, and carbon sequestration. Climate impacts our entire state. When I improve the health of our soil, it not only helps production, but it provides a great climate solution. That's a win-win that benefits ranchers like me and our planet.
Hi, I'm Shannon Maganyezen. I'm the host of the Climate Correction Podcast, where you can search on Google, find our uh, podcast on any podcast streaming service, and listen to the lineup of all the speakers and panelists you've heard today and those that are still to come. We provide uh, bi-weekly episodes, um, really great speakers, lots of different um, information that's available to you to help you learn how climate change affects your everyday life and how you can be part of the solution. Next up, I'm really excited to welcome Nat Cohan and Fred Krepp. Nat is the Senior Vice President of Climate at Environmental Defense Fund, and of course, Fred is the president, and you're going to sit in on an amazing conversation. Here it comes. Well, hi, Fred. It's good to be having this conversation. Um, it's an auspicious moment for, for climate change and climate progress, uh, and I actually want to start there. I want to ask you how you think about this moment. I think you started at EDF back in the day when you were an intern, uh, and then a few years later, started running the place. And so in the 37 years that you've been uh, at the helm of EDF, I, I'm curious if you reflect back on that, how do you think about the present moment with respect to climate change? Well, thanks, Nat. Good to see you as always. Um, you know, this is without a doubt, uh, the best moment we've ever had to make progress on environmental issues generally and climate change specifically. And, and the reason that, as you know, is because people have connected the dots between hurricanes, surging storms, um, heat waves, and, and climate change. They're seeing the impacts in their own lives. Also, because technology is now advanced, renewable energy is way cheaper than it was before. We're seeing the advance of electric cars. Um, businesses see an opportunity here to be part of uh, the transition to a new economy. And, and people are seeing just high paying good jobs. So, um, you know, whether we're talking about, you know, the key areas that EDF works on, the the power grid or transportation, agriculture, or the oil and gas sector and driving methane emissions down. In all of those areas, um, you know, it's the time is, is ripe for change. We can get a 50% reduction in our climate emissions by um, 2030 on our way to net zero by 2050. You know, Nat, I think there, there's one thing that, um, speaks to me a lot about the moment we're in. And that's uh, five years ago, I met Mary Barra, the CEO of General Motors. And uh, we talked about the need to make a transition. It was a good conversation. We didn't, we didn't agree on everything, but we agreed to keep talking. And since then, uh, we haven't agreed on everything. But um, last fall, I reached out to her and said, hey, can we talk um, about putting together a joint vision for how we could get to all cars being, new cars being electric by 2035? She said, yes. Our teams got together and did create a vision. In late January, GM announced they were going to commit to all electric vehicles by 2035. And to me, and the actions of other car makers um, being similar, that says now is very different than any other time in my life. Yeah, that story about GM is, is, is a great one. And as you say, is really symptomatic, emblematic of the moment we're in with all the commitments and the pledges we're getting from companies, not only in the US, but globally around climate. So I, I wanna zoom in on one particular state that matters a lot in the US uh, in terms of climate impacts, but also matters a lot in the US in terms of politics, and that's Florida. Obviously, Florida, um, home to cities uh, like Sarasota and Miami that are exposed um, to the consequences of climate change, um, but also a state that, um, you know, that, that is, as I said, a, a sort of bellwether and a, and, and a pivotal state for US politics. Talk a little bit about what you see happening in Florida and, and the kind of solutions uh, that, are, that are happening on the ground there. Well, Nat, first of all, you're 100% right. Uh, Florida is extremely influential in our nation. Um, not only a lot of people live in Florida, but it's politically um, at the center of what's possible and not possible. And the good news is uh, the people in Florida have also seen the impacts. 
and indicated their supportive of climate action. Poll after poll shows this. Beyond that, people in Florida are saying they want to adopt solutions. And what I, I recently saw a poll that said 43% uh, of all the voters in Florida plan to purchase an electric vehicle. Now, hey, some of those people are, they, they're just purchasing them because they're just playing better, faster, accelerating cars, not because they're environmental, but that's okay. Um, it shows tremendous support for doing one of the most important things we can to lower emissions. There's no question also, I, I've uh, spent time in Florida and I've seen local governments um, leading on this issue, educating people about the health impacts, um, the climate impacts in Southeast Florida. You know, one thing that comes to mind is that um, most people, uh, parents and children alike, have had the experience of riding on a big yellow school bus, vinyl seats, half windows, um, undeniably uh, the smell of a dirty diesel engine. Uh, and that tailpipe pollution causes problems for children, for bus drivers, problems that have been documented in scientific studies. Kids that come to school on diesel buses perform less well in school, kids who ride on electric buses. But what a moment in Miami-Dade County, uh, they're in the process of converting their school bus fleet from diesel to electric using money from the state. And what I love about this story is the change was brought about by a science fair project of an eighth grader named Holly Thorpe. She measured uh, the levels of carbon dioxide inside school buses and outside. And it turned out inside were 10 times higher than the level EPA considers safe. And that convinced the whole district to make the switch. Electric buses solved this problem because they run on battery power, no harmful diesel pollution, no dangerous climate pollution either. And that's why at EDF and our Moms Clean Air Force are advocating for school, for school districts across the state of Florida and around the country too, to switch to 100% EVs. Recently, three Congresswomen introduced uh, the Clean School Bus Act that will provide grants for school districts to purchase 100% electric vehicles and to install the needed charging stations. Um, the Clean School Act would create a program at the Department of Energy that would offer the technical assistance as well as financial assistance to those traditional yellow polluting buses. And, um, would be a $200 million a year program from fiscal year 22 to 27, resulting in uh, over a billion dollars investment. So that gives me hope that our nation's school children will soon have a safe, clean ride and while we're moving climate in the right direction. Let me ask you, Nat, tackling climate change is a global challenge. And I'm wondering what you see since you lead EDF's global efforts on climate uh, what you see are the leading solutions happening worldwide. Well, thanks, and, and it really, I feel like zooming way out, I think the story about the school buses in Florida is so concrete and, and, and so, so real to people's lives. And, and at the other end of the spectrum, if you think about it, are the, you know, some of the policies that can be put in place that are being put in place that really align the whole economy with those climate solutions so that individuals and businesses and firms can all figure out the best way to do it. You know, I don't need to tell you, Fred, the EDF has always stood for market-based approaches that can help address environmental challenges like climate change. And one of the things that I see around the world is more and more of those market-based approaches being put in place. In some ways, EDF helped pioneer this uh, not for carbon, carbon dioxide, but for sulfur dioxide, which causes acid rain. And we helped put in place, of course, the program that essentially solved acid rain in this country. And, and that became a template. Europe has a market-based program in place for carbon dioxide, for climate change that they've recently strengthened. 
a few years ago, people were saying, well, the European program is really on its last legs, but now it's looking really strong. It's really driving emissions down, helping Europe meet its targets. Just this year, China became the latest country to put in place a national uh, emissions trading system when it put that in place for its power sector. We say it's open for business starting this year. So now that's the largest emissions trading program in the world. And we help design that and provide advice and input to the government. Of course, it's going to need to be strengthened over time, just like the EU program is, but that provides a huge amount of hope. And then also last year, the international aviation sector put in place a market-based approach. So as that sector rebounds from the crisis of COVID, we're already seeing travel pick up again. There is now a cap in place on total carbon pollution from airlines and a system to make sure that they're meeting that cap. And if they go above it, they have to reduce emissions elsewhere, including by protecting tropical forests. So we're seeing those market-based solutions come into play. We know they work and we're seeing them work around the world. And that's, you know, that's something that I see as a real trend uh, that, that, that provides a lot of hope. Let me ask you, Fred, as you, as you look around, uh, what gives you hope moving forward that we're gonna make more progress on climate? Well, thanks, Nat. And you're very modest in describing the, the program to cap climate pollution from um, Ernst. You know, thanks to you and your leadership and your team, uh, the world has adopted that program. Um, so uh, air traffic is down temporarily because of COVID, but it will rebound and everyone on earth will um, owe you for keeping the skies cleaner. You ask what gives me hope. Um, just a few days ago, my um, daughter-in-law gave birth to um, a new granddaughter and I had the chance to hold her yesterday and look in her eyes. And what gives me hope is I know um, only I can't fail her, but none of us with children, let alone grandchildren, um, can fail to clean up the climate pollution. And, and as we recognize this is pollution, we've got to get it out of the system. Now we have the technology, now we have the chance to do it. Um, I know we will succeed. I know when I talk to business leaders today in 2021, different than years ago, whether it's Doug McMillan at Walmart or Mary Barr at GM I mentioned earlier, there's a, a level of commitment now to being part of the change that gives me, you know, tremendous hope. That's, that's inspiring and, and congratulations on, uh, on, on the birth of your grandchild. So Fred, one question I know you get a lot, I get a lot is uh, what can average people do? And so what, are the, what sorts of meaningful actions can folks who are listening or watching this take to make a difference on this issue? Well, one thing people in Florida can do is um, get involved, uh, contact uh, their federal elected official, um, whether it's the Senator Rubio or anyone on the congressional delegation about supporting the Clean School Bus Act. At the state level, there's also, even though the uh, state legislative session is almost over, uh, there's uh, legislation pending also on clean vehicles, electric vehicles and people can contact their state legislate, legislators on that. Um, the uh, important you know, link here, um, if people want more information is let's tackle climate change florida.com. Let's tackle climate change florida.com. And uh, thank you, Nat, for uh, this conversation. Well, thanks, Fred, and, and thanks to the Volo Foundation for hosting the conference and for having us on. It is the quality of life on this planet that we want to pass on to future generations. Climate change is a defining topic of our lifetime, but it's also a place for tremendous opportunity. The work that we do now, we may not realize, even during our lifetime, the important impact of it. I was skeptical myself. As a data scientist, I always have to crunch numbers myself before I believe scientists. And when I dove into the numbers on climate change, uh, they were pretty alarming. We care about it because what seems like a relatively small change is actually an enormous amount of extra heat. And that extra heat is weighting the dice against us. 
Last year, we also forgave FEMA $16 billion in, from their flood program. So FEMA was basically bankrupt last year, um, and we forgave them $16 billion. What is that unique skill set that you possess that can be applied to all the avenues and industries trying to mitigate carbon and correct climate? Hello, I'm Kate Williams. I'm CEO of 1% for the Planet, a global community of members and nonprofits creating environmental change. And I'm so excited to be here today with Gael Witzenberg. She's the founder of uh, Charlie Banana, which is a collection of baby and children's products that combine eco-friendliness, quality, and design in one brand. Um, she is passionate about building a much more sustainable world, and she has lived around this world from the Caribbean to Canada to Hong Kong. And she has 25 years of strong business development experience under her belt. Um, and Gael's company, Charlie Banana, joined 1% for the Planet as a business just last year in 2020. And what it means to be a business in our network is committing to giving 1% of annual sales to environmental nonprofits. So I'd like to um, dive right into our questions. So Gael, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and your amazing work? Hi, so nice to be here with you today. Uh, well, yes, I, I've been a mompreneur uh, and uh, I decided that every parent should have the choice to club diaper and I felt that it was a mission and um, it's just so nice to see club diaper becoming so popular today. So it was a strong mission. It was one of the hardest products um, to choose. <laughs> Nobody wants to wash diaper <laughs> until they try and they realize it's so easy. Uh, but what's wonderful is that it's really affecting every uh, aspect of parenthood and the planet because the choice that we make has such an impact. So it, has become my life mission and it's been a really really fun journey so far i love the parenthood and the planet because that really does pretty much cover it all and that's great that that that's the that's what charlie banana is all about so thank you so much for sharing that and you know you mentioned that it's hard um was there a moment a learning or an experience you know as part of your journey to get this business off the ground that pushed you to bring a focus on climate change into charlie banana well i grew up on a boat and i was always surrounded by blue lagoons and when i was in hong kong i was surrounded by beautiful building but also a gray sky and that's when I realized we have to change how we do things because if we continue the way we are, there is no return. And I realized that when you become a parent, you change the way you are. It's a totally shift in your relationship with life, love, and the planet, so to speak. And so um, baby product, how you're going to raise your next generation is so impactful and it starts from you know the time you change your diaper and then it evolves so when you start being eco-friendly with diapers you become eco-friendly with what you eat what you put on your skin where you travel how you travel the type of car you drive etc and i find that it really starts from the club diaper that you start on and then it just changed your journey into life uh, into really being a good uh citizen and a lot of time people say, hey, you know, it doesn't matter, it's just me. But what people don't realize is that individual effort is really key. And that's what I love the 1% because it's just 1% of your sales that you donate for the impact. But it has such a huge difference is every company donate just 1%, it becomes thousands. And in the Caribbean where I grew up, there's a, a, a proverb in Creole that says, Café en sac. It means grain of rice make a bag. And I feel that as individual citizens, we have a responsibility to do the best we can in every aspect of our life to, better, to be better eco heroes. And we all can be one. And, um, and together, we really have the power to reverse things that we've done bad in the past. So I think it's all inspiring what we can do on an individual basis as a one. 
That's awesome. I love the um, grain of rice um, uh, metaphor. That's fabulous. Thank you for sharing that and for, for just like connecting those dots from diapers all the way through everything. Um, and, and with that, and this may be a hard question to answer just because you see it as all as so connected, but what impact are your efforts with Charlie Banana having? Well, we, we are sold in 66 countries now, and um, I, I think I, I cannot really measure in number the amount of, of diaper that we saved, but usually a baby use about 6,000 diaper uh, disposable over the first 24 months. With Charlie Banana or any good club diaper brand, you use between 24 to 36 diapers through the life of your child, and they're usually good for your second child. So the amount of reduction of waste, the amount of, um, you know, we use a lot less resources to, to produce everything. So I, I think just on the sustainability, I think it's huge, the, the change, you know, one baby, 26 diaper versus 6,000 multiplied by how many millions of babies that are out there and we're just starting. Um, I think the fact that we modernize cloth diaper and we um, cater to a broader audience, I think it helps uh, debunk the myth of cloth diaper that they're old, that they have pins and all of that. Our product are modern. The cloth industry nowadays is modern. Uh, we all have beautiful product and we are now available in major retailers. So I think we are really uh, legalized club diapering, <laughs> so to speak. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and, and that I think is helps um, to to start the, that new, greener, more sustainable, mind-oriented parent that really care about what they're putting on their baby you know, the impact of each product that they're buying. Yeah, that's great. Um, and I'm sure that, you know, as inspiring and positive as that is, you have faced some obstacles along the way. It's inevitable, I think, in, in building a business. Can you just share, like, what have been some of the obstacles and how you've overcome them to get to this, you know, amazing growth and amazing brand? I think that the biggest uh, obstacle was really the banks because, in Hong Kong, the government was helping small business at the beginning with small loans. But after that, we were either too small to get the proper loan that you want. Um, and also the major retailers, we've been very lucky with them, but it was hard to, you know, get the shelf space because, um, you know, we're less traffic than other brand or other baby products. So, uh, but they all understood that they needed to show some green paws and, and have all the different type of products. So going through that, uh, being able to sustain the growth without the financing help, uh, without the capital venture and the support of the retailer was definitely an interesting challenge, but I, I, I can say we win. You know, we, we're available. Bye Bye Baby was a huge uh, partner from the start. They always had a big section of cloth diaper. Uh, they always believed in it and we're in 130 stores with them and Target, uh, Target.com and Target Store were also huge. We were the first cloth diaper available in major retailer. So that took some effort, but we won. In the end, we won. And that gives me that gave me faith then that I was in the going the right direction because sometimes you doubt yourself, thinking, oh my God, Gail, you're crazy. You know, and so many people can say things to discourage you. And uh, and it was hard, but we've re um resetting my intention on a monthly basing and basis and, and believing in, in the power of that product and the goodness that it can do to the world in all aspects of it, you know, how soft they are for the baby and the baby are so comfortable, how cute they are, how economical they are, you know, and, and, and the sustainability, how it reduces waste, the impact that it has at all level was so fantastic that, you know, it, even though it was hard, it gave me the strength to push through. And, and usually I always say to a new entrepreneur, that have an idea for business, I said, you know, when everything is hard, are you sure that the product you're doing has all those things that are going to push you to the next level when you're really low on your, you know, 
mojo and and that's really key because if you are if you know you're gonna win and and the reason out there then it's it's you unstoppable yeah that's really great to hear because it sounds like you had some very real objective challenges but you had such passion and clarity about the the purpose that was driving you that that kept you going and i loved how you said you also like reset that intention every month because i know even if you're super passionate and purposeful, you still sometimes need to come back and be like, all right, like, what's the yeah. focus? So that's so great. It sounds like you had some really great practices. And it's so remarkable um, how you managed to succeed and grow, even in the face of some of those challenges. So hopefully you've created some space to, to you know, for some others to step into as well. Um, and what does, just like at that higher level, what does give you hope to keep going in you know, in the face of both those like specific business challenges, also just you know, the environmental challenges on our planet. Well, I, I think there's so many great entrepreneurs today that are changing the world at all level. Uh, we, we're really in, a, in an area of shifts and what used to go before doesn't go anymore. And as challenging as it is, it's really exciting because everything can be redesigned better. Um, so it's a lot of opportunity uh, and a lot of really cool new product that, um, you know, all the new materials that are being developed with uh, lensing and model and tensiles. And, you know, it's just fascinating because if you're a product designer, it, the sky is the limit. Um, so it's, um, I think, we we if we all collectively really make an effort we can uh, we can really change everything that we've done bad or at least good or correct some of it so we don't have issue in the future and i think the new generation really cares about that and even if political you know people don't make the right change i think the people are voting at the supermarket and I think you can see it everywhere in the natural market, in the baby industry. At the, you find coconut water everywhere now, you know, kombucha and all those things where before you were a weirdo, if that's. So mm -hmm. I think <laughs> I think kombucha is the new Coca-Cola. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think that's a great point. I mean, we have definitely seen at 1% for the Planet how, you know, there's such strong consumer interest in brands that are, embedding purpose and real solutions into the, their products and services. And now for most things, as you were saying, you can start to look around and see that you can choose something that's better for the planet. And so that's where the opportunity lies. But also, as you were saying, there's still some products that need to be redesigned and that we do need to sort of create that better for the planet opportunity. So, you know, lots of space for innovation out there. Yes, lots. So it is very positive. I think if you are positive, you see positivity all around you versus the opposite. And I rather live on that side of the spectrum. <laughs> it's a lot more fun, I think. Yeah. And you also meet amazing people that are kind of optimistic and that will help you to get there. Um, and if we are all positive on how we can impact the world and our life and other people's life around us, because we're, I always say, you know, uh, optimism is contagious. So if we all inspire on being the good entrepreneur, do the right things for our staff, for our product, for our customers, then we put that out there in the universe. And then, you know, then it inspires other people. And then together, then we're stronger. You know, it's like a herd immunity, so to speak, uh, to be better citizen. And we all have that responsibility. So. It is a, a great time to be an entrepreneur. Uh, it's a great time to be alive and the technology that we're able to have to benefit is, is fantastic if you're creative. <laughs> well, that is, um, that is such a great um, message that I think we'll use that as a our wonderful um, point to end on because it's so positive and just such a great point that that really you know, living in that positive space creates more of that same positive space for others. So love that message. Um, and so grateful to you for your membership in 1% for the Planet, for your amazing product, which is making such a difference to the planet. 
um, and also just taking the time today to have this conversation. So thank you so much. Thank you, and and I'm I'm really proud that we could become you know part of the one person of the planet. I wanted to do it for a long time, and uh, you know when the timing is right, usually it happens. So uh, we're really proud to be part of it and to be able to share it with our customer as well and educate them on all the great stuff that one percent does. And it's all about the one percent, right? <laughs> That's right. That's right. Well, thank you so much. And, um, and we'll wrap it up there. Thank you. Thank you, Kate. Esta es la Ciénaga Grande de Santa Marta y se está muriendo. Todo lo que ves son manglares secos luchando desesperadamente por su vida, al igual que su gente. Un ecosistema que una vez fue rico en biodiversidad y que es fundamental para afrontar el cambio climático, ahora nos necesita. Como la luna que Quiero contarte por qué hoy más que nunca es tan importante que trabajemos todos unidos y devolvamos la abundancia a este territorio de humedales que une a los Andes con el Caribe, cuna de la cumbia y que lamentablemente se ha convertido en lo que alguna vez llamé Somos un país anfibio, siempre lo hemos sido. Desde la Amazonía hasta el Caribe, el agua nos determina. El río Magdalena es el más importante del país. Su cuenca es el hogar de la mayor cantidad de colombianos y de él depende buena parte de nuestra economía. Colombia necesita con urgencia un gran proyecto nacional para restaurar su cuenca, limpiar sus aguas y regenerar nuestra relación con el río. De eso depende nuestra supervivencia en el futuro. El río nace en el Páramo de las Papas, ubicado en la cordillera central entre los departamentos de Cauca y Huila. Atraviesa buena parte del territorio en medio de los Andes, antes de entregar sus aguas al Mar Caribe. A su paso genera zonas con una gran diversidad de tipos de humedales que han sido de gran importancia ecológica, cultural e histórica. Allí se ubica la nación Pocabuy, primera huella del origen de la cumbia. Allí está la región de La Mojana, donde la cultura Zenú supo desarrollar una compleja tecnología hidráulica para convivir con el agua y no en contra de ella. Paradójicamente, desde la época de la conquista, hemos venido perdiendo los saberes y ecosistemas que hoy la ciencia nos propone recuperar para adaptarnos con soluciones basadas en la naturaleza. La pérdida de estos saberes y de la cultura anfibia aumenta la vulnerabilidad de los ecosistemas y de nuestra sociedad ante la incertidumbre del cambio climático. Particularmente crítica es la situación que hemos generado en el delta del río, conformado por el sistema de humedales de la Ciénaga Grande de Santa Marta. El ciclo natural del agua en este delta es un complejo y delicado equilibrio que depende del intercambio entre el agua dulce del río Magdalena, el agua dulce de cinco ríos que bajan de la Sierra Nevada y el agua salada del Mar Caribe que genera varios ecosistemas, entre ellos los emblemáticos manglares de la ciénaga. El agua evaporada en el gran humedal alimenta los picos nevados y páramos de la sierra, dando origen a esos ríos que bajan de las montañas y desembocan en la ciénaga, cerrando así el ciclo del agua. El cambio climático se percibe como un fenómeno local simultáneamente con la persistente afectación humana sobre este ecosistema. La Ciénaga Grande sufrió de una epidemia y no nos dábamos cuenta. ¿Por qué se está muriendo tanto mangre en la costa de Salamanca? ¡Está cañondo! Esta afectación se debe a muchos factores, entre ellos la construcción de carreteras que no reconocieron estar sobre humedales. Específicamente, la carretera Ciénaga-Barranquilla, que fue construida en el año de 1956, impidiendo el intercambio natural entre el agua dulce del río y el agua salada del mar. Aparecieron la carretera, hicieron el puente, se ha acabado el pescado. La historia de la carretera, así como la estoy contando, tenía 14 años, ese era puro mangle. Todo esto era puro mangle hasta Barranquilla. De igual forma, la carretera paralela al río Magdalena, que se construyó en los 60s, ha hecho que el río se desconecte de su delta, impidiendo el desbordamiento natural de sus aguas. Y finalmente, una tercera carretera, la vía Pibijay Fundación, ha terminado encerrando la ciénaga, aislándola de los flujos naturales del río y sus humedales de amortiguación. Ha sido un perjuicio para la ciénaga, uno y otro, porque la, todas las barras se han, han cerrado. Al cortar las barras, 
marchitan un poco la producción que le entrega el mar a la ciénaga grande. Entonces la ciénaga queda sin oxígeno, porque los ríos, las bocas están secas. Al mismo tiempo, el uso intensivo del agua en las grandes extensiones de cultivos y la desecación para ganadería contribuyen al deterioro de los flujos de agua en la ciénaga. Donde antes hubo abundancia y una próspera cultura pesquera, hoy hay un drama humanitario y ambiental que es tal vez el más crítico del Caribe. Porque esto no es para un solo corregimiento, este es para todo el mundo entero que la fábrica más grande que hay en toda la República de Colombia se llama la Ciena Grande. ¿Por qué este problema es un problema internacional? Voy a darle solo dos ejemplos. Las aves migratorias necesitan la ciénaga como refugio en las temporadas en que el norte y el sur del continente se enfrían. Perder la ciénaga significaría un duro golpe a las migraciones de aves en América. Por otro lado, la ciénaga y sus humedales actúan como un filtro de sedimentos que permite que el agua del río llegue limpia al mar Caribe. Sin embargo, está sucediendo todo lo contrario. Los sedimentos y contaminantes han impactado los frágiles ecosistemas del Caribe. Hace unos años, Jamaica interpuso una demanda al Estado colombiano por la afectación que el agua contaminada del río Grande de la Magdalena genera en sus corales. La delicada situación de la ciénaga ha ocasionado un desplazamiento ambiental que sumado a las acciones de grupos violentos han creado un verdadero cordón de extrema pobreza de aproximadamente 50.000 personas sobre la carretera Ciénaga-Barranquilla. Esta cifra parece alarmante, sin embargo equivale solo a la capacidad de un estadio de fútbol. No nos puede quedar grande la tarea de pensar en la recuperación social y ambiental de esta población que podría vivir en equilibrio con el ecosistema. Lo que pasó fue que allá se metieron esa gente mala a las 5 pm de la tarde. Llegaron a mi casa, lo sacaron al yerno, a él, al hijo mío, se lo llevaron. Si no se nos cogió así de sorpresa, a las 5 de la tarde que se metieron, fue matando gente, matando gente, y nosotros no sabemos cuál es el motivo. Inocente nosotros no sabíamos. Mandaron a apagar la luz. Toda la noche yo pasé orando, toda la noche. A mí se me pelaron todas las rodillas hasta el tiempo del tiempo de la amanecida. El pueblo alarmado quedó vacío cuando en la mañana se sorprendió. Nos sorprendimos y fuimos a ver. Y habían más de 10 muertos. Y apenas salieron, amenazaron al pueblo que tenían que irse, si no ellos iban a regresar otra vez. Yo estaba tranquila porque estaba en el pueblo mío, pero los demás, viviendo aquí, yo tengo una amargura en este pueblo. El gobierno colombiano se propone construir la doble calzada sobre esta importante vía. Desde la iniciativa Tras la Perla proponemos que este proyecto, además de garantizar la solución al histórico problema de altos índices de accidentalidad, también cumpla con altos estándares ambientales y sea acompañado de un proyecto social y de infraestructura integral asociado a la identidad que permita la regeneración cultural de esta población y del ecosistema incluyendo a los pobladores de la vía y a los tres pueblos panafíticos que aún sobreviven y que constituyen un verdadero patrimonio que debemos preservar. Yo le di a la muchacha aquí que, que vinieron de la doble casada que para me dime a meter allá en Sevillano, prefería dime para mi pueblo. Dicen que van a quitar los, los barriecitos estos para pasar a nuevo calzado y todo. Verdad que aquí esperaremos para ver qué piensan ellos con nosotros porque no tenemos nosotros mandismo ni para nada. Esperaremos qué van a hacer con nosotros ellos. Ana, Isidoro, Aida, Tomás, Hernando, Lida, Evaristo y Nicolás son descendientes de la milenaria cultura anfibia que estamos perdiendo. En ellos, en sus vidas y en sus historias está la clave para adoptar soluciones basadas en la naturaleza que permitan mirar al futuro con esperanza. El primer paso que proponemos para avanzar en este objetivo es implementar el modelo organizativo y de investigación Planos Vivos. Los Planos Vivos son una metodología original de investigación y diseño de estrategias para la renovación y la regeneración de hábitats. De esta forma se podrán encauzar 
las decisiones, desarrollar proyectos innovadores y de estrategias acertadas para posicionar la ecorregión de la Ciénaga Grande de Santa Marta como piloto mundial de adaptación climática productiva, incluyendo producción alimentaria, ecoturismo, urbanización y arquitectura sostenible, producción cultural, economía regenerativa y diseños de vanguardia. Igualmente se podrá tener la información de contexto integrada y enlazada desde una visión multidimensional e imparcial, contribuyendo a que esta ecorregión tome un rumbo acertado en cuanto a la regeneración de humedales y sus comunidades asociadas. Desde Tras la Perla convocamos al gobierno, a todos nuestros aliados y a la comunidad internacional para implementar un proceso eficaz de regeneración del complejo de humedales más importante del Caribe. Este propósito es de vital importancia no solo para Colombia, sino para el continente americano y para el mundo entero. Maravilloso y emocionante el trabajo que está realizando la organización Tras la Perla en la Ciénaga Grande de Santa Marta. Para hablarnos más al respecto, hoy tenemos el honor de contar con la presencia de Carlos Vives, dos veces ganador del Grammy y 15 veces ganador del Latin Grammy. Carlos Vives es una de las figuras más importantes de la música latina y creador de un nuevo sonido a partir de las músicas tradicionales de la costa caribe y la región norte de Colombia. El trabajo de Vives como artista gira en torno al estudio, el conocimiento y la divulgación de la identidad colombiana en sus múltiples facetas y en su compleja diversidad. En 1993 creó la banda La Provincia como un homenaje a los músicos de las regiones más apartadas y rurales del Caribe y como un laboratorio para nuevos talentos de la música contemporánea. Con la banda ha viajado por el mundo llevando la cultura y el valor de la identidad colombiana a todos los rincones del planeta, ganando reconocimiento internacional para la música del país. En el año 2015 fundó la iniciativa Tras la Perla para promover el desarrollo sostenible de la ciudad de Santa Marta y su región de influencia en la Sierra Nevada y la Ciénaga Grande. Gracias, Carlos Vives, por estar con nosotros para contarnos un poquito del trabajo de la regeneración de la Ciénaga Grande de Santa Marta. Cuéntanos por qué es importante para ti como artista el ecosistema de la Ciénaga Grande de Santa Marta. Thais, gracias por esa presentación tan generosa. Eh, sí, es, es importante. Yo, yo creo en la filantropía transformadora. En, en, en países como los nuestros, eh, donde la brecha y las desigualdades son tan grandes y la dimensión de las problemáticas son tan grandes, tenemos que unirnos. Tenemos que unirnos eh, en lo público, en lo privado, tenemos que lograr alianzas de todos los eh, dolientes de, de las regiones, de nuestras ciudades. Y eso es lo que ha querido nuestra, nuestra eh, fundación, de Tras la Perla. Tras la Perla, la Perla de la América fue el primer nombre que le dieron a, a, a ese lugar. Como tú dices, ciudad-región tiene que ver con una ciudad, pero tiene que ver también con su entorno. Además, mucha naturaleza, una, un, un, un ecosistema muy biodiverso y al mismo tiempo eh, de una diversidad cultural increíble. Y entonces, eh, para mí era importante... Eh, tener una iniciativa como ciudadano de tocar puertas y preguntar por las problemáticas de, de, de mi ciudad. Entonces, así nació eh, Tras la Perla y hemos podido eh, atraer eh, aliados eh, en búsqueda de soluciones para las problemáticas más, digamos, más, más, más fuertes, más importantes de nuestra ciudad de Santa Marta. Y, y bueno, y yo te contaba, Santa Marta eh, tiene, es, un, es increíble porque... Santa Marta, a, a la izquierda, está la desembocadura del río Grande, ahí donde está Barranquilla, donde nació Shakira. Eh, allí desemboca el río más grande de Colombia, que es el río Grande de la Magdalena. Eh, eh, a mano derecha y a espaldas de la ciudad donde yo nací, está eh, el macizo colombiano, la mayor altura de Colombia, los 5.890 metros sobre el nivel del mar, una de las mayores depresiones costeras eh, del mundo. Eh, entonces, imagínate es, esos lugares, es, es, una, 
la, la mayor cantidad de especies de aves en el mundo antes de la problemática que tenemos en el delta de la ciénaga grande que me preguntabas, este, recibamos la mayor cantidad de especies de aves en el mundo. Y, eh, y hicimos mal una carretera, interrumpimos la comunicación del agua dulce con el agua de sal y eso conllevó una situación, un desequilibrio en la ecología, eh, por supuesto, eh, que, que trajo situaciones muy difíciles para la tradición pesquera, eh, artesanal, histórica, eh, poca bullana, de los palafitos, de las viviendas sobre el agua. Así, me, me, la, cuando yo hablo de la ciénaga, sabes, Thais, me acuerdo, tengo que pensar en cómo nos cuentan en la historia, cómo era el Golfo de Maracaibo en, eh, cuando llegaron los primeros europeos, ¿no? Sí. Gente que vivía sobre el agua porque tenía una relación con el ecosistema. Este, son culturas anfibias. Este lugar del que yo estoy hablando, que tiene que ver con grandes ciénagas, no solamente la ciénaga grande de Santa Marta y el delta del Magdalena, sino innumerables ciénagas y de ríos que se conectan y que yo este territorio lo llamé cumbiana, coincide con ese lugar donde nace la cumbia, donde nacen los vallenatos y donde nacen los porros, donde nace la música que al final yo escogí para trabajar y reinventarme y hacer nuestro pop y hacer todas nuestras locuras. Entonces, por supuesto, eh, descubrirlo como colombiano, reconocerlo como colombiano me lleva a, a querer formar parte de la solución, a buscar ser cómo aportar a la solución eh, eh, con la fundación y atraer, eh, aprovechar el cariño de ustedes y de la gente para, para llamar la atención sobre el territorio y, y contarles en eh, nuestra fundación eh, qué hacemos, cómo va, por ejemplo, eso de la carretera, qué estamos haciendo eh, en este momento. Ya, estamos... que hables de las soluciones, porque de hecho la semana del clima en la Florida se trata de las soluciones, no queremos más los problemas. Y como sí. tú lo dices, somos ciudadanos del mundo, y como ciudadanos del mundo nos tenemos que unir. No, eh, que has dicho algo importantísimo, Thais, porque si nosotros comprendiéramos que más allá de nuestras nacionalidades, eh, todos dependemos de nosotros, si la siena está mal, los patos del Canadá, las aves que migran desde la Florida o del sur de los Estados Unidos, cuando bajan las temperaturas y llegan allá a Santa Marta, donde soy yo, a pasar unas temporadas, sí. si yo no tengo bien allá ese lugar, eso, esos visitantes antiquísimos eh, que no han necesitado pasaportes ni visas para, para, para tener sus espacios y moverse sus espacios, es importante. En, no, no, a nosotros en Colombia, la contaminación del Río Grande nos, eh, nos eh, proporcionó una demanda de Jamaica por daño a los, al sistema coralino. Exacto. Es decir, es, todos dependemos es círculo, de todo. Es un círculo, todos estamos unidos. Todos, de estamos, todos de dependemos de todo. La, ahí tenemos que olvidarnos un poco de esas fronteras para poder entender que, eh, que, que, que el, el trabajo tiene que ser unidos. Pero, pero sí, trabajamos con la comunidad. Eh, Hacemos, hacemos también un trabajo que, es que cuando yo te hablo de filantropía, el, el, siempre, siempre quisimos ayudar desde lo privado, quisimos ayudar y la gente que ha tenido la posibilidad, ha tenido dinero y, funda su funda, y busca sus fundaciones, digamos que hay una historia del asistencialismo que no, que no, que no, nos, no nos soluciona a, a, a mediano y a largo plazo las cosas, yo creo que hay una manera, una, una forma de desde lo privado conectarnos con las necesidades y unirnos, aliarnos eh, para lograr entre todos eh, ir acortando esa brecha, ¿no? Entonces, bueno, no, trabajamos en, en la siena en muchos aspectos, estamos involucrados eh, acercando eh, el gobierno, las alcaldías, eh, lo, los biólogos, los ambientalistas. ¿sabe? lograr mesas de diálogo donde podamos, si se va a rehacer esa carretera, por favor, es una segunda oportunidad en la vida para mejorar eh, ese daño que hicimos al principio. Entonces, un poquito es, es, es el, nuestro trabajo, conseguir aliados eh, y, y siempre como que en, encontrar, ir conociendo, oír a la gente, trabajamos con las comunidades y los cambios que generamos sean a partir de ellos mismos, el empoderamiento de ellos en sus localidades, en los barrios. 
hago un trabajo en un barrio que amo, Thais, que se llama Pescadito, que es un barrio en la ciudad de Santa Marta que nació con el puerto cuando llegaron los ingleses para la exportación de la fruta, el primer ferrocarril, este, eh, el primer balón de fútbol, somos un barrio eh, de estirpe, de, de grandes deportistas, de grandes personalidades, somos cuna del carnaval. Y entonces trabajo con la comunidad eh, para recobrar esa identidad, trabajar con ellos, eh, de pronto eh, es ese trabajo que no es cemento y ladrillo, sino que tiene que ver con las comunidades, con oírlas y entender esa identidad. Y cualquier cosa que uno haga eh, de, de infraestructura vaya realmente atado a ese sentimiento de lo que son para que no se nos vuelvan obras eh, porque logramos una ayuda de alguien. No, buscamos encaminar las ayudas y, y, y los amigos que logramos traer a la ciudad encaminarlos a proyectos fundamentales eh, con gente idónea. Con, eh, no, hemos, hemos traído en educación con IOTU, de la Fundación Carilla, de la Fundación Carulla, hemos traído este, apoyo este, dentro de lo deportivo, con fútbol con corazón, son fundaciones especializadas en, en trabajar con las comunidades y no con el niño en la cancha, sino con el niño en su casa. Sí, hacemos cosas que... que ha logrado que, muchas alianzas emocionales, es lo que sí, te sí, oigo sí, decir, exacto. más que alianzas eh, materiales, y eso es mucho más importante, creo yo. Sí, no, definitivamente. Y también convencer a la ciudad y tenemos que trabajar que, eh, con el alcalde y con la gobernación y con la gente sí, que, no, es, que realmente pueden, pueden, pueden tener, este, lograr cambios. Y con las grandes empresas y, y al, al final... Tenemos que trabajar todos, aliarnos todos, la agroindustria, eh, los pescadores tradicionales, los músicos, porque es que somos una tierra de, de muchos artistas. Somos muy artistas. Y entonces eh, es una ciudad con muchos talentos y, y vivimos en un parque, porque re realidad, que es el lugar que yo te menciono, es un parque, y sí, debería ser un parque. A mí cuando me dicen que qué opino de que hagan cosas, no sé qué. No, para mí debería ser un parque, porque un lugar con esas características es, no es de nosotros solos, es, de, es del planeta. Ser el ombligo del mundo como lo es la Sierra Nevada de Santa Marta. Que tengamos la suerte que hoy en día, Thais, eh, eh, existan culturas ancestrales con un, con un fundamento espiritual, eh, increíble, las culturas taironas, los mamos de las culturas cogis y arahuacas de la Sierra Nevada de Santa Marta, es, debemos entender que para nosotros es una suerte tener a esos magos eh, y, a, y, y que hoy, cuando estamos buscando soluciones y cuando la misma ciencia nos, no, nos invita a buscar soluciones como las que ellos ya han planteado toda su vida, de cómo comportarnos con nuestro medio ambiente. Bueno, Carlos, y me imagino que alguna de tus canciones está relacionada con el ecosistema. ¿Te importaría cantarnos un poquito y decirnos de dónde vino eso? Sí, Thais, naturalmente la música y nuestra música está relacionada al ecosistema. Cuando yo, digamos que en la época que yo cantaba baladas y que decidí cambiar el rumbo de mi sonido buscando un pop a partir de mi música tradicional, digamos de los vallenatos que uno cantaba, de las cumbias, y buscar ese camino, uno se daba cuenta que esos juglares de esas canciones, La Gota Fría, esa Matilde Lina, esas primeras canciones que canté, eh, eh, la, la relación de ese compositor con su medio ambiente era increíble. Entonces su inspiración no era exactamente la radio, ni su inspiración era o la televisión o el internet, sino eran las aves, el río, la mujer, ¿no? la campesina. Entonces digamos que siempre fue una música que estuvo directamente relacionada con con el ecosistema, la cumbia y los vallenatos, la música que al final yo empecé a usar para hacer mi música nueva, mi forma de proyectar canciones viejas y de hacer canciones nuevas, al final está directamente relacionada con un territorio anfibio, que hablábamos hace un rato, que tiene que ver con los grandes ríos, con las grandes montañas que desembocan, y esos ríos que desembocan al Caribe, y que es el territorio que yo llamo cumbiana, y entonces, sí, mira, mis canciones, desde que yo grabé los viejos clásicos y empecé a hacer mis canciones como esta que decía, como la luna que alumbra por la noche los caminos, como las hojas al viento, como el sol espanta el frío, como la tierra la lluvia, como el mar espera el río, 
Así espero tu regreso a la tierra del olvido. No tenemos una tierra del olvido. Y la vida a veces nos lleva eh, por caminos buenos, no son caminos malos, caminos buenos y a veces no, nos alejan de, la tierra, de esa tierra que todos llevamos en nuestro corazón. Entonces para mí fue importante porque fue un camino de regreso. Eh, ya yo estaba viviendo por fuera y entonces empezar a hacer estas canciones, reconectarme con el territorio, esa primera carátula que, que en esa época fue un escándalo en Venezuela, y qué dolor de cabeza en ese momento cuando la tierra del olvido, yo mostraba la situación de la sierra, de la siena y al mar, las ballenas, las aves endémicas, los personajes. Bueno, esa época ya empecé como a conectarme con eso. Y cuando uno va descubriendo que realmente todo lo que hemos hecho y que si le debemos a alguien es a, ese, es a esa cultura que estaba muy ligada con un ecosistema. Y... Eh, eh, Taís, que te digo, este, eh, tiene mucho que ver eh, con la cultura eh, con la que yo he trabajado y, he hecho, y hemos hecho canciones. No, no, no solamente yo, una nueva generación de artistas colombianos del pop están directamente vinculados a, a, a la música que tiene que ver con una región, con, ya sea con una montaña, con un páramo, ya sea con estas ciénagas gigantes, de estos ríos gigantes, y estas playas, estos desiertos en el Caribe. Sí, con un, un ecosistema muy loco de lo hermoso y de lo increíble, porque son un sistema increíble. Entonces, es increíble que en lugares tan mágicos, tan, tan, in, tan inimaginados, es decir, este, existen tantas diferencias, existen tantas problemáticas, eh, eh, y no nos, no nos podamos poner de acuerdo. Entonces, digamos que siempre el trabajo desde la Fundación es poder acercar a, a, a cosas bonitas para, 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 para la gente. Y entonces también he cantado cosas como, y es que contigo la vida tiene que ser de verdad, tiene que sentirse lindo ser en tu historia el galán y susurrarte al oído cuando te vuelva a encontrar. Mírame, quéreme, sentate conmigo y contame tus penas cumbianas. Sí, a mí, a mí me gusta cantarle a la sierra, le canto siempre a la sierra, a la ciénaga, a, a, a mi tierra, como, como quien le habla a, a una mujer, o quien le canta a un hijo. Y yo le la llamo, madre naturaleza es mujer. ¿Ah? <risa> la madre naturaleza es mujer, ya sabes. Es la mamá, sí, no, 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 ya. Es es ya eso ya lo tengo ra, eh, claro hace mucho rato. <risa> Carlos, y yo sé, bueno, muchísimas gracias por tu tiempo, sé que tu tiempo es muy valioso, quisiera que por último nos dieras cómo podemos apoyar todos a, a, tras las piedras en la Ciénaga Grande de Santa Marta, Al, algo que quieras decir a toda esta audiencia que nos está escuchando en este momento y que obviamente como floridianos nosotros entendemos lo del Delta, yo creo que el Leico Kichobi aquí pasó algo muy parecido, hicieron una carretera que hizo que el agua no, no venga a los Everglades como se debe, debería uh, a venir y, y lo entendemos, entendemos que eso está pasando en muchas, muchos otros países y queremos ayudar y queremos ayudar no solo en Estados Unidos, queremos ayudar a nivel global, entonces las cámaras son tuyas. Bueno, no, tú sabes que tenemos en Conservación Internacional eh, un aliado importante para nosotros en, en Santa Marta, eh, tengo un amigo eh, que es especializado, estudió aquí y en la Florida y es especializado en los Everglades y por supuesto conocemos, nos, nos ha acercado un poco la problemática y por supuesto eh, todo lo que se ha hecho y se sigue haciendo. Así que para nosotros sí, es importante eh, conocer de cómo, cómo, qué ha pasado en otras partes y de cómo nos, nos puede enseñar y ayudar mucho esa experiencia. Este, no, que nos busquen, que conozcan nuestro trabajo en www tras la perla eh, www.traslaperla.org y entonces ya van a conocer de nuestras acciones y se pueden acercar, se pueden comunicar con nosotros y les contamos y me encantaría eh, pues tener más aliados en, en, esta, en este camino de Tras la Perla y bueno, tenemos un equipo, eh, estoy seguro que les, eh, les vamos a poder eh, eh, comunicar eh, todo lo nuestro de mejor manera. 
Claro que sí, y nosotros estamos siempre a la orden. Muchas gracias por tu tiempo y por compartir con nosotros esta información tan importante. Otra vez los invitamos a que los busquen a visitar traslaperla.org y a conectarse con ellos a través de las redes sociales como para que conozcan esta increíble causa y pues muchísimas gracias una vez más. No, Thaís, gracias a ti. Gracias a ti y bueno, eh, sabes que cuentas con nosotros también. Unidos somos más. Bueno. I'm a company and I pollute, but I don't pay for it, you do. A carbon dividend means I will start paying you for my pollution. This will motivate my shareholders to invest in clean energy and you get paid in the meantime. Hello everyone, I'm John Anderson, president of Greenleaf Communities. We research solutions to environmental problems, including climate change, the most significant threat to humanity and life on earth. Today, we will discuss a policy approach that accelerates the adoption of many solutions to the problem, and that is putting a price on carbon and doing so at a global scale. Dr. Francine von den Brandelier directs our research, and she will share with you what many believe is the key piece of the climate solutions puzzle. Francine? Hello, my name is Francine, and I lead climate research and policy at Greenleaf Communities, a nonprofit that applies research for a healthy and sustainable world. And today, I'd like to talk about carbon pricing, and more specifically, a carbon fee and dividend approach, as an essential tool for the U.S. to meet its climate mitigation targets. So first, let's take a quick look at the climate science. The graph on the left shows different pathways for future global greenhouse gas emissions. The graph on the right links these emissions, these emissions pathways to different scenarios for increases in global average temperatures to avoid the worst climate change impacts, which means no more than two and preferably 1.5 degrees Celsius of warming, global carbon emissions will have to decline significantly. We talked with Dr. Don Weebles about the climate science. Dr. Weebles is a professor of atmospheric science at the University of Illinois. He was a climate advisor under the Obama administration and a co-leader of the fourth national climate assessment, which was published in November 2017. So in a high scenario, you know, we might be talking about eight to 10 degrees Fahrenheit increase um, in temperature uh, relative to current temperatures by the end of this century. Um, that's huge. Um, if you look at the past uh, uh, changes in climate, like during ice age, the ice ages were about 11 degrees Fahrenheit colder than now. So if you imagine eight to 10 degrees warmer than now, we're talking about a substantial change that is outside of the human experience. But the reality is, is that it's not just about warming, it's about the impacts on in, in the intensity of severe weather. Uh, the fact that you get more heat waves is one aspect of that, but, but also when you get precipitation or rainfall or snowfall, it's more likely to be a larger event already and even more so into the future. Uh, so that, that means a more likelihood for floods and some areas are going to see less rainfall overall than they've had in the past. Some places are going to see more rainfall than overall in the past. So that leads to a possibility of droughts in some places and floods in others. And sometimes even in a place like Illinois, where, uh, you can get the combination of the two. Climate change affects different regions in different ways. So from wildfires in California, droughts in the Southwest, hurricanes in the East and Southeast, crop failures in the Midwest and much more. And this will unfortunately lead in more lost lives, severe economic costs. On the top right, you see two maps that show how temperatures in the US will increase by the end of the 21st century under a lower scenario of warming and a higher scenario of warming. And you can see that the difference is quite drastic. So a study by the First Street Foundation found that we are currently seeing about $20 billion in yearly e expected economic damage from flood risks across the United States. Florida and California are experiencing the heaviest losses. And Florida alone accounts for nearly $8 billion a year in potential losses. For many, these costs will increase in the next decades. And you see that on the map on the right. Uh, 
In some cases, annual loss from flood damage could more than double by 2051. And the problem for Florida is not limited to floods. Currently, Florida experiences around 25 days of dangerous heat per year. Projections under a two degree scenario of warming indicate that by 2050, that number will increase more than fivefold to 130 such days each year, more than any other state. We'll now hear from Dr. Bob Correll. Dr. Correll is a global climate scientist and principal for the Global Environment and Technology Foundation. He's also a Florida resident. People ask, so why is the Arctic, why does the Arctic matter? It's just a cold place. Um, well, first of all, what happens in the Arctic will happen in lower latitudes a decade or two from now. So it's kind of the bellwether, the Arctic in the coal mine, so there's, I mean the canary in the coal mine, helping us see to the future. But, that, but that's only trivial part. It has substantive reasons because the melting of glaciers is the most rapid in the two poles in the Arctic and in Greenland. And <clears throat> the Arctic melting as we have it today, and that includes Greenland and the mountains of, of Alaska and Canada and, and, and the Hill Himalayas, of what we call the third pole, they account for about 40% of the sea level rise. The, Another 40% of the sea level rise comes from just the warming of the ocean, the expansion. So those two things together account for 75 to 80% of sea level rise as we see it, know it here in Florida, because here in Florida, like some other parts of the US, we're, we're increasing the sea level at a pace roughly 50% uh, higher than the global mean. So what can we do about the climate crisis? Well, the most effective solution is to price carbon. We need a whole range of solutions, but we cannot meet our carbon reduction goals without some form of carbon emissions pricing. It's a key part of the puzzle. Here we see research by Energy Innovation that shows that just 10 policies in five sectors, as well as some land use measures, could be enough to have a 50% chance of hitting a two degree of warming target. Carbon pricing alone could reduce emissions by more than 25% between now and 2050. That's more than any other solution. So what exactly is carbon pricing? Carbon pricing simply means putting a price on carbon emissions so that the cost of climate change impacts are better reflected in our production and consumption choices. It also gives low carbon options, for instance, solar panels, electric vehicles, which do not impact our climate, a better chance to compete in the market. There are basically two forms of carbon pricing. There's a carbon tax, which places a fee on each ton of carbon dioxide emitted, and cap and trade policy, which puts a cap on the carbon emissions and issues the quantity of emission allowances consistent with that cap. Carbon pricing is an economi economically efficient way of reducing emissions because it directly targets these emissions. As emitting carbon becomes more expensive, we all start looking for technologies and products that use less carbon. This fosters a transition to cleaner energy and drives innovation. A robust carbon pricing mechanism can put the economy in a path towards the deep cuts in emissions that the science shows are required to avoid the worst impacts of climate change. Although other measures to mitigate climate change are also necessary, Carbon pricing is the one solution that makes the biggest difference. And economists agree. In 2019, more than 3,000 economists signed a statement in the Wall Street Journal in support of a carbon fee and dividend approach. And that included 27 Nobel uh, Prize winners, two former secretaries of the US Department of Treasury, and it also our colleague and co-author, Dr. Roy Worley. There are also nine carbon fee bills in Congress. And these have support from both Democrats and Republicans. Currently, there are over 100 members of Congress that have signed on to these different bills. There's also support from senior administrative officials, such as our new uh, Secretary of the Treasury, Janet Yellen, John Kerry, Christiana Figueres, one of the key figures behind the Paris Agreement, George Schultz, who passed away last month and served as Secretary of State under Reagan.
Many research centers and think tanks have done research that shows that some form of carbon pricing is necessary to significantly reduce our greenhouse gas emissions. And some entities have publicly endorsed the carbon fee and dividend approach that includes the National Academy of Science, Sciences, the Climate Leadership Council, the Citizen, Citizens Climate Lobby. But there are also a number of NGOs, such as uh, the World Wildlife Fund, uh, and corporations, including oil companies themselves, that support this approach. A growing number of industry leaders are coming out in favor of carbon pricing due to the clear price signal and certainty. Banks, financial markets, regulators, they are all increasingly concerned about climate risk, and they're largely coming out in favor of a robust and reliable climate policy, such as a price on carbon. We will now hear from Bob Litterman. Uh, Bob Litterman is a board member of the Climate Leadership Council and founding partner of Kepos Capital, an investment advisory firm based in New York City. It's a vision that has been endorsed by a huge number of folks, any, you know, uh, uh, corporations ranging from ExxonMobil and Shell, Total, a number of uh, the major oil majors and utilities, the auto companies, GM and Ford, banks, including Goldman Sachs and JP Morgan, uh, consumer companies, and including Unilever and Johnson & Johnson, uh, you know, over uh, just thousands of uh, economists, virtually the entire economics profession. You can see the endorsers on our website, including Janet Yellen, who's now the Treasury Secretary. Uh, so there is widespread understanding uh, that we need to price carbon. The CFTC report, it was the, you know, unanimous view of everyone on that, you know, 34 uh, stakeholders in the financial system. The National Academy of Sciences endorsed it. All of the major uh, business organizations, the Chamber of Commerce, National Association of Manufacturers, the American Petroleum Institute has endorsed it. Uh, we've got, you know, endorsements from environmentalists the World Wildlife Fund, uh, the World Resources Institute, uh, and so on. So everyone agrees. Uh, there's no controversy here about this. Uh, we should be pricing uh, carbon. Last year, Greenleaf Communities collaborated with Dr. Roy Worley, an economist, and Dr. Don Weebles, who we heard from earlier, to study how such a carbon fee and dividend policy should be designed to ensure an effective and equitable energy transition. And this led to our report, which you see on the left, addressing climate change using a carbon tax and dividend plan within a global compact. So how does it work? Well, a carbon fee is set at a rate, for example, of $25 per metric ton of CO2. And this would correspond to about 25 cents per, uh, per gallon of gasoline. This fee is collected at the source, the mine for coal, the wellhead for oil and gas, and the fee increases over time, sending a signal to the markets, which unleash creativity and innovation to provide the non-carbon alternatives. The rate continues to increase until a set date and level. For instance, $125 per metric ton of CO2 by 2030. The dividend means that all the revenue collected is redistributed to adult citizens every quarter. We use Energy Innovations model to assess the effectiveness of our proposal. We looked at what would be the effect of our carbon fee if implemented in 2020 and rising until 2030. And you see that just with our carbon fee alone, we easily meet the US Paris Agreement target for 2025. And while we need to combine this with other solutions and longer term targets, it can do more than any other tool on its own. But a fair energy transition is also crucial. Low income communities and communities of color are particularly affected by the impacts of climate change. So it's very important that our transition to a clean economy is fair and doesn't put a heavy burden on those who are already struggling. And this is possible thanks to the dividend components. Through the carbon fee and dividend, most households are better off. In fact, 60 to 70% of households could receive more cash back dividends than they pay in carbon fees. Those who pollute the most pay the most in carbon fees, and that tends to be those who can afford it. And here you see in this table three 
potential individuals uh, from different uh, that have different income levels and you see that those that have lower incomes get to keep more of their dividends by pricing carbon we're also going to see a transformation of our energy use in the next decades the graph on the left shows how sources of generated electricity would change in the next 30 years if the US aggressively moves towards electrification and a net zero emissions target. We see that renewables increase significantly, especially wind and solar, whereas fossil fuels are quickly phased out. And the figure on the right shows a change in total energy jobs between 2020 and 2040 in line with a two degree target. It shows that reducing carbon emissions and switching to renewables would create more jobs than it would displace. It could produce around 25 million peak new jobs. And these are well-paying jobs and they're highly distributed geographically and difficult to offshore. Now here on the graph on the left, we see how greenhouse gas emissions have increased since the 1850s. And we see how different regions of the world contribute to these emissions. So that shows that the solution clearly has to be global. Not a single country can do it alone. And for this reason, we propose the creation of a global climate compact led by the United States to ensure that other countries join in the energy transition. And this is based on the work of William Nordhaus, professor at Yale University and recipient of the Nobel Prize in Economics. This, this plan recognizes that governments and businesses are unlikely to meet emission goals if other countries do not play by the same rules. So to join the climate compact, there are two basic membership requirements. First is the implementation of a similar domestic carbon tax in each member country. And that would support the transition to clean energy at a global scale. The second requirement is the adoption of tariffs between five to 8% on all goods entering their borders from non-member countries. And these tariffs would encourage more countries to join the compact. And the goal is first to level the playing field so that carbon pricing doesn't harm domestic industries. And two, to convince more countries to join in the effort. If the US and other major economies form the starting group, others are very likely to follow. And this could then have an enormous impact on mitigating climate change. On the bottom right, you see modeling results that show that most countries and regions would join the climate compact if the carbon price is not excessive and tariffs are sufficiently high. So with a $25 um, dollar, uh, per ton of CO2 price and a 3% tariff, uh, we, you would have at least 12 members join the compact. But with a $50 carbon price, which would have a greater effect on reducing global emissions, tariffs would need to be 5% to obtain similar results. We'll now talk with Professor Jeff Colgan from the Watson Institute at Brown University. And he will tell us about the need for global climate collaboration. Yeah, one of the things that happens when you start to act on climate inside the United States, whether it's through a carbon tax or cap and trade systems or regulations even, uh, however you approach it, you run the risk of putting manufacturers in the US at a competitive disadvantage compared to countries that don't have those kinds of pro-climate policies. And this is especially true for industries like steel or glass or cement uh, that, that are, are heavy emitters, heavy industry. Um, and so to, to deal with that, one way of uh, approaching that is to use something called carbon tariffs, or they're also known as border adjustment measures, uh, to put tariffs on the borders between countries that have a strong climate policy and the ones that don't. Uh, and uh, the European Union is already looking into doing this and they intend to go forward. Uh, they might put those tariffs on the United States if we're not careful. Uh, and the Biden administration similarly has said that they wanted to uh, do this. Uh, but unilaterally, these kinds of carbon tariffs can create problems for the international trade system, which of course is designed to lower tariffs and to, to create more trade between countries. Uh, and so 
the ideal approach is for countries, uh, particularly the, the really central economies of the world. And here I'm talking about three big players, uh, the United States, Europe, and China. Those three uh, are the biggest economic players and they're also the biggest emitters uh, in the world of, of greenhouse gases. And so ideally what we'd like to see is a, a, a climate club where those three countries agree to keep their tariffs as is, so nothing needs to change uh, between them, but for other countries that are not doing an, uh, as much on, on climate policy in their own territories, then those countries, potentially even including India, uh, might face tariffs on their manufacturers, their goods, um, uh, and, into, into economies that have pro-climate policy. So what you see here in this map is that carbon pricing is already happening around the world. You see that there are more than 60 countries and states, uh, state governments that have implemented the policy. But the US is still absent, although there are some subnational initiatives on the West Coast and the Northeast. As of 2020, existing carbon pricing initiatives in place or scheduled around the world already covered almost a quarter of global carbon emissions. Canada implemented a, a carbon fee and dividend approach in 2019. And uh, by 2017, already seven of the world's 10 largest economies had implemented carbon pricing. The US risks falling behind in the new global energy economy as other countries move on, and it could lose its position as a global leader in technology innovation. The clock is ticking. Time is running out for us to address our global climate crisis. We must adopt effective climate policy this year. A carbon fee and dividend approach has bipartisan support and can play an outsized role in accelerating our transition to a climate resilient economy. And while it's not the only climate solution that we need, it's our best bet for rapidly moving away from fossil fuels and leaving a safer and more resilient planet behind to future generations. Thank you very much for your attention. And if you have any questions, we would love to hear from you. Feel free to contact us at the email address on the screen, and you can find more information about our research on the, the link to our website that's posted right here. And uh, I hope we will hear, hear from you, and uh, I'm happy to answer any questions that you have. Thank you for joining us today, everyone. We work with a range of partners on policy and practice solutions to climate change and other environmental resource issues such as fresh water, clean energy, healthy soils, and material reuse. You can read about our work and connect with us via our websites that are shown here. Thanks for all that you are doing to advance a healthy, sustainable world, and have a good day. Hello, climate correctioners. Thank you for your interest in current events, crisis solutions, and impact. Vola Foundation has a rare opportunity through this event to join all humans to mitigate a severe and mounting crisis. Impacts from climate change are happening right now. Scientists say recent extreme weather events were made more likely by us, human-caused climate change. Normally in my role at Bola Foundation, I'm working with a variety of nonprofits through charitable contributions to program partners who help us meet our mission. Our mission is to accelerate change and global impact by supporting science-based climate solutions, enhancing education, and improving health. Climate correction provides this awesome opportunity for a private family foundation to partner with other innovators like you who think beyond our own lives, making the world a better place. Did you know that in 2020, Volo Foundation partnered with 56 program partners? In case you didn't know, I work for a data scientist. So let's quickly tally percentages to where Volo Foundation's funding went in 2020. And some exciting environmental good news is global emissions fell by 7% in 2020. Renewable energy is becoming more prevalent throughout the US and the world. Fossil fuels, especially coal, are beginning to be phased out. All of Volo's partners have been working to create a better future. On behalf of Volo Foundation trustees, Thais Lopez Vogel and David S. Vogel, and the entire Volo Foundation team, we congratulate each of you for your vision to get involved to act and protect yourselves, your families and businesses. By watching today, you are pursuing leadership to courageous climate solutions. 
It's our hope that climate correction empowers you with data, knowledge, and climate awareness. Bolo Foundation strives to a more renewable, sustainable future. You, me, the nonprofits, Bolo supports, and climate correction speakers are globally aware. We are part of a much larger ecosystem. And with that in mind, please help me welcome Britta Gross from RMI. Hello, everyone. Welcome to my presentation today on the positive impact of climate solutions. My name is Britta Gross. I'm the Managing Director of Mobility Program at RMI. I've been there about a year and a half. Before this time, I spent a number of years in aerospace, but relevant to today's discussion, I spent about 25 years in automotive, mostly at General Motors, on their battery electric vehicle and hydrogen fuel cell electric vehicle programs, and specifically what it takes to drive the market to widespread electrification. I want to make sure I communicate four things today. Why transportation electrification matters, what's in it for you, what's in it for everyone, and why it's going to happen, especially if you and I engage now. The reason this is really important is that the United States um, is the single largest emitter of emissions, carbon emissions from transportation in the world by far. You can see on this map, US leads, China follows, Russia, India, and et cetera down the list. So it's really important that we get this right, that we address transportation as, as, as in fact, in the United States, the single uh, leading sector of emissions uh, of carbon in the, in, the, in the country. So really important to get this right. So if you look at 2050, back it up to 2040, back it up to now 2030, 10 years, less than 10 years from now, where do we need to get um, if we're going to get on any kind of sensible pathway to one and a half degree C temperature containment in the world. And so what this slide shows you here is that it's going to be a really big challenge. You can see here uh, in the art, in the illustration to the right, that we need to electrify in the next 10 years about 27% of the light duty vehicle fleet. That's all the cars and trucks on the road that you and I drive to work, to the store, to the gym, wherever we're going every day. That's 70 million electric vehicles in 2030. Again, if we're taking climate as a target and backtracking and backcasting to what we have to achieve. If we look at the trucking sector, they also have to achieve an enormous 15% of electrification across their sector. And in the bus sector, the transit buses, the school buses, et cetera, another 29% of those vehicles. Again, we're trying to find some good fits for what would have to happen given what's more likely and where we have those sectors that are more easily electrified than some of the other ones like long haul trucking, which is gonna be a little bit more challenging than some of the other sectors here. We're not the only sector that has a lot of challenges here. You see in that text box to the left, um, not only do we have to electrify these vehicles, but we have to reduce vehicle miles traveled by about 20%. And the trucking sector has to make some improvements in vehicle mile traveled. And the grid's got to get greener because the electric vehicles are only as clean as the grid. And so we're assuming in our modeling that, that the grid is 85% carbon free in the next 10 years. That's 75% from renewables, another 10% from nuclear, and 15% natural gas that'll just sort of be with us still for another 10 years or so after that. So no sector has it easy. And I haven't even shown you the building sector, the industrial sector, et cetera. Transportation though, is sitting right there in the middle in this spot where we've got to take care of it. And we're gonna to have to make some really uh, big improvements here in especially the light duty vehicle sector. So let's take a look at what's been stopping us so far in, um, in electrifying, what's in our way. Well, there are three things that really are in our way. One is just the cost of the technology and the cost is sitting in the battery. There's really good news here though. Uh, after about a decade and a half of automakers, battery makers prioritizing the cost of this technology, it's come down about 85% in the last 10 years. So that's an incredible achievement in this sector. And so a great, great progress in addressing the, the sort of the incremental cost of electrifying our vehicles. We're not all the way there yet. I project that in the next five to six years, we will have parity. On, on battery vehicles with gasoline vehicles that we know today. And, and that means even in the mainstream or lower cost segments of these vehicles, not just in the luxury vehicles where it's easier to sort of move numbers around and make these products work, but in that mainstream sector, try to get some exciting products in the 25,000s and $30,000, uh, low 30s um, um, area for the vehicles. The second barrier has been lack of charging infrastructure. 
Now the beauty, and I'm gonna talk about this a little bit more in a, in a bit, the beauty of charging infrastructure is, is that unlike gasoline stations where you're forced to go to the gas station to fuel your vehicle at night or whenever it sort of is, is you know, convenient enough to get to a gas station, electric vehicles can charge in your driveway, in your garage, in a carport, at the store, wherever you have charging infrastructure. So there's a lot more flexibility, a lot more um, freedom we have to choose the places we wanna charge our vehicles. And third, we've gotta build EV demand. And that just means that folks listening to this um, webinar here today, think about the, the vehicle you're driving today. Fleet operators, think about the, the vehicles operating your fleets. We've got to drive demand, we've gotta show automakers, truck makers, bus makers that were here to buy those products, and we've got to get these vehicles on the road. So those are the three areas that need to make progress. If I just do a little tutorial, just to make sure that we're all on the same page, because I think a lot of folks have been lost in the, in the sort of the conversation about how tough some of this stuff is. And so if we look at charging just very briefly, there, there are sort of three levels of charging. There's level one, level two, and DC fast charging. When we talk about level one charging, Every vehicle I know of in the market can charge just by plugging it into an outlet in your garage or in your carport or you know wherever you have access to an electrical outlet. It looks just like those pictures down there. In fact, the picture underneath the level one column on the right, that's my garage, my outlet that I've been using for about 10 years uh, for electric vehicles that I've been bringing home and driving every day. Level two is another um, charger. It's faster. You can do about 25 miles per hour that the vehicle is plugged in. You can buy one for your home. You find these at workplaces. You find them in the grocery store parking lots and all over the place. And then DC fast charging is going to become sort of the gas station of the future. These are these high power uh, charges that you're going to use on the, on the way to uh, much further destinations. So you'll see them along highway corridors. You might even see them a lot of them in urban environments to help folks that live in apartments and condominiums that just don't have a place at night to charge their vehicle. They'll be able to charge at one of these DC fast chargers um, in their communities. Same thing for urban vehicles, delivery vehicles, Ubers and, Ubers and Lyfts. They'll make uh, wide use of these chargers as well. And so when we look at sort of what's happening with charging infrastructure today, the vast majority, this sort of green bottom of the big pyramid, the vast majority of all charging is done at home today. Most folks that buy these vehicles um, have places they can charge the vehicles conveniently at home, and that's where the majority of charging is taking place. Second most likely place and most popular place today is workplace. And then just the top of the spear, the part that really isn't used so much, but is important for the perception that you can charge these vehicles in many, many places, that's gonna be your public charging. And only 5% or less of all charging is actually done in the public space. So again, this benefit of electric vehicles is you can charge at your convenience where you wanna charge these vehicles. And a combination of work, uh, home, work, and public charging is gonna satisfy all these different um, charging needs. If we look now at what's happened in charging infrastructure, remember this is the second barrier I talked about. Charging infrastructure has made vast leaps in um, getting infrastructure placed in the ground in the last six years. So you see on the left this map of where we were with charging back in 2015, uh, 204 charging stations in, in the United States. And these are publicly accessible, uh, the industry, the, the most popular uh, industry uh, standard for charging infrastructure. And, and now you see just fast forward here to 20, um, just March here of this year, and you see 4,200 charging stations and about, well, 7,500 charging plugs at these stations. So a much different scenario, a much different landscape. And I'm only showing you here the DC fast charging. I'm not even talking about the level two charging you can find in the parking lots of your grocery stores and all the other places. So again, vast, vast improvements been made. And I wanna make sure that that's really understood um, that we're making a lot of progress, not nearly where we have to be in the next 10 years to get it to a number that supports a number like 70 million EVs that I talked about but still vast progress, just like we are on the making progress on the cost side. And so if we look now at like, why, why does this matter? What's in it for you as a driver? Well, look at the left side of this slide. There is no question that driving an electric vehicle is just inherently better. It's a better experience than, than a gasoline combustion engine vehicle. It's smoother, the acceleration's better, the handling's better, you don't have that transmission shifting as you move up along a, a mountain road, curving up and down. Um, they're quiet. They, they, they are like silent spaceships that just sort of accelerate smoothly and glide forward at an intersection or slow down at an intersection when you come, come to a stop. So they're very quiet. They're also, there's less, there's, there's less stress. 
So the engine vibration, you never notice this until you actually do drive an electric vehicle. The engine vibration is just gone on an electric vehicle. It's smooth. You don't have that combustion engine uh, churning away and causing a lot of stress. So that's a really important advantage of these vehicles too. Safe and convenient home fueling, just like your cell phone. When the opportunity arises, plug in your vehicle, just like you plug in your cell phone every night. Fuel savings, right? A lot of projections out there on average over a 14 year life of a vehicle, you can expect to save about $12,000 across the United States. And so, you know, huge fuel savings, the cost of electricity is much uh, lower than gasoline and it's a much more stable price than gasoline. You all remember price, uh, gasoline prices uh, spiking and peaking here over the last few years and then plummeting. I mean, just it's hard to keep up with what's happening with gasoline prices. Electricity prices don't do the same thing. And then, of course, it's clean. You park these cars in your garage. Um, they're clean. You can pre-start the engine with the garage door closed, make it warm so that it's plugged into the wall, warm up that vehicle. So when you drive away, you're, you're using that battery all for the range of uh, the driving range of that vehicle. So really powerful combination of attributes that are really good for the driver. And just cast your eye to the right hand side here. What's in it for everyone else? We're addressing climate. We're cleaning the air and health. And again, in the middle of COVID, this is this has become a very, very big and very uh, visual um, understanding, right? The meaning of um, shutting down these tailpipes and cleaning up our air that we breathe, especially in urban environments. U.S. competitiveness. There's a whole area of looking at electric vehicles and understanding it, it's it's the whole world is going to electrification. China, Germany, India, everywhere. And that means that if we don't lead in this area, we will not compete and we will lose this market. So it's really important to to um, grasp this and make sure that we understand that this is an industrial strategy. Um, I've already talked about price stability. We can actually go on to the next slide as well. Just trying to make sure that we point out what's really important here, thank you. And so when we look at the key players taking action, I just wanna make sure that everyone understands we are not in this alone. There is a lot of new mom, of, of movement and motivation right now. It's really a really, really exciting time. Biden's announced that he plans to electrify the entire federal fleet, including the US Postal Service. California, Massachusetts, they've announced that by 2035, they don't wanna see electric uh, gasoline combustion engine vehicles sold in the state. Follow the money is the next bullet. If you look at the banking sector, the, in, the asset management sector globally, they are looking for investments uh, that are no longer tied to carbon or have risks tied to climate events. And so take a look at uh, Black, uh, BlackRock, look up some of these banks. There is a trend now with where the money's going. GM also just announced that after 2035, they also aim to sell only electric vehicles. So again, I can add more and more to this list of the movers and the shakers out there that are making this really real. If we pop to the next slide, there, there are a few things that need to happen at the federal level to really give us the leadership and guidance. We haven't had a goal in this country since 2010. It's time to put a, a, a goal in place that makes sure that when GM and California and Massachusetts and um, Amazon and FedEx, when they're announcing these goals, what does it add up to? Does it add up to enough? Are we getting even close to the 70 million electric vehicles needed on the road by 2030? So I, I'll let you at your leisure read the rest of the slide, but just keep in mind how important it is to sort of put the stake in the sand, show some leadership, drive where this is all going, and we're not in it alone. When I look at a number on the next slide, when I look at a number like 70 million electric vehicles, and which means one in four of us need to be driving electric, an electric vehicle in just a few, in, in just a few years from now, I just want to make sure that people understand, I, I think it's doable, and I think there are some things to arm ourselves with to have this conversation with folks. First of all, the average transaction price for a new vehicle in 2019 was about $39,000. So the price of electric vehicles today is not out of bounds for folks that look at new vehicles. And so when I consider either used EV purchases or um, new EV purchases in the market, there are plenty of options that are getting more and more affordable and we can afford to get into these vehicles. 60% of Americans live in single family homes that have access to an outlet in a garage or outside where I might plug in the holiday lights. 66% of Americans have more than two vehicles in the household. So if folks are using the excuse, well, I wanna go up into the mountains and I need snow and they don't offer EVs in the model I'm looking for. 66% of us have a couple vehicles in the home. And so there's a really optimal way to balance the kind of vehicles that we have in our households. And then finally, 80% 80, 80 of Americans commute less than 40 miles to and from work a day, 
pre-COVID numbers, obviously we're doing a lot less driving than that today. So again, EVs, both battery electric plug-in vehicles, but also plug-in hybrid electric vehicles, they serve these purposes, easily meet the needs of most Americans today. And I think with that, I just want to summarize and leave you with one final thought. And this is a quote from Bill McKibben uh, that he made to the Rolling Stone magazine here a, a year or so ago. And he said, when it comes to climate, winning slowly is the same as losing. And I want to leave that message with you because in the next 10 years, we've got to make a lot of progress and winning slowly is the same as losing. Thank you for listening today. Hi there. Thanks for giving me the chance to shout about the UK and our climate goals. I'm delighted that we're able to join you virtually to support Florida Climate Week and the Volo Foundation. Now more than ever, we need solidarity in sustainability. As we, the global community, recover from the coronavirus pandemic, every country faces a choice. We can lay the foundations for sound, sustainable and inclusive growth, grounding our economies in the industries of the future. Or we can tie ourselves to stranded assets, familiar ways of the past, locking in polluting emissions for decades to come. Despite the good reasons to be optimistic, there's still enormous progress to be made to meet the challenge of climate change. We need to move to decarbonize the global economy three to five times faster in the next 10 years than we've been doing so over the last two decades. We need to encourage countries to seize the opportunity to develop green, inclusive and resilient recovery plans. To accelerate the transition to a low carbon future, we need stronger national and international collaboration not only by governments, but by businesses, by academia, civil societies, and every individual has their own role to play. As you may know, the UK and Italy are co-hosting COP26 in Glasgow in November. Our efforts for the climate conference are focused on developing and implementing nature-based solutions to climate change. Um, that's with clean energy transition, clean transport, green finance, and adaptation and resilience. The aim of COP26 will be to persuade that the zero carbon economy is the growth story of the future. Last December, the UK's nationally determined contributions were announced and it commits us to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions by 68% by 2030. And that's the highest reduction target made by a major economy to date. It represents a significant increase in ambition to tackle climate change over the next 10 years. And it keeps the UK on track as the country accelerate, accelerates towards net zero. This new target underscores our commitment to the Paris Agreement and it raises the bar for global climate ambition. Indeed, we've led the world in tackling climate change, cutting emissions by 43% since 1990, which is the fastest in the G7. My Prime Minister also announced um, the UK's green industrial revolution at the end of last year. This is a 10 point plan that's underwritten by 12 billion pounds worth of investment. And we aim to eradicate our contribution to climate change the 10 points are built on the UK strengths. And I'll just run through them and summarize them briefly for you. Number one, offshore wind will quadruple our energy output from wind by 2030. Number two, hydrogen economy will create the first town heated entirely by clean hydrogen by 2030. Nuclear, we're investing in both large and advanced small scale reactors. Number four is electric vehicles, the UK is committed to no sales of new internal combustion engines by 2030 and no sales of new hybrid vehicles by 2035. We want to be the first to decarbonise our road transportation. Which takes us on to number five, public transport. We want to make cycling and walking more attractive by investing in infrastructure and in zero emission public transport in our cities. Number six, jet zero and green maritime planes and ships. We're investing in the research that will help decarbonize these really hard to decarbonize industries. Number seven, homes and public buildings. The UK has some really aging infrastructure and we want to increase the energy efficiency of our buildings. Number eight, carbon capture and storage. We'll remove 10 metric tons of CO2 from the atmosphere using CCS technology by 2030. This will make us the world leaders in this emerging area of science. Number nine, uh, nature, the UK is planting 30,000 hectares of trees per year and investing in our natural environments, both on the land and in the ocean. And finally, number 10, which is finance. We want to position the City of London as the global centre of green finance, underpinned by innovative technologies that ethically leverage our resources. Thanks once again for inviting us here today. Thank you. Lugar, 
apenas el color Haciéndonos sentir Que cada día es la vida Nuestro lugar Donde al amanecer Nos abraza la luz Y el olor de la brisa El milagro de amar En el horizonte Y más allá, y más allá. Cobijándonos El sol Nuestro lugar de maravillas donde el poder de una voz nos cambiará nos llevará a reconocer el camino hacia un mundo mejor hacia un mundo mejor La Amazonía contribuye a la estabilización del clima global y posee la mayor diversidad del mundo. La selva amazónica representa el 10% de la biomasa total del planeta. Una canción pintando los sueños, melodía de paz susurrada en el viento. Puede despertar una sonrisa y guardar el calor de una caricia, el poder del amor. Es la fe que nos abriga, más fuerte que el calor del sol. Nuestro Preservar la biodiversidad es de vital importancia, porque garantiza la sostenibilidad de todas las formas de vida. Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining this panel session. My name is Christiana Oyenoga. I am the city's program manager with the Nature Conservancy in Florida, where I work with a cross sector of partners to plan, implement, and manage green infrastructure projects, projects that integrate nature-based solutions here in the Orlando metropolitan area. I am pleased to host this virtual panel session to share with all of you a little bit about the work the Nature Conservancy is doing, as well as our valued partnership with the city of Orlando. But first, I wanna start off with a bit of a refresher on the Nature Conservancy's mission and our work in Florida. Since its founding in 1951, the Nature Conservancy has grown to become the largest conservation nonprofit in the world and one of the most effective working to create a world where people and nature thrive by protecting the lands and waters on which all life depends. 
our work relies on scientific evidence and on scientific analysis, a pragmatic and innovative style, and a culture of collaborative approach with diverse partners and stakeholders. We take a nonpartisan and non-confrontational approach to conservation at the local level and all the way to the global stage. We work in 72 countries across six continents. And here uh, on the domestic stage, we work in the US in all 50 states. We are currently celebrating 60 years of conservation in Florida. And over the past six decades, we have helped protect over 1.3 million acres in Florida alone. TNC currently owns and manages over 55,000 acres of land in conservation. That includes our Disney Wilderness Preserve, which is, uh, which is just a short drive for where, for where, from where I am sitting here in, in Orlando. In addition to the protection of lanes and waters, we focus on uh, the connectivity of wildlife corridors. We focus on climate adaptation and mitigation on urban conservation in order to build healthier green cities. Here at, at the Nature Conservancy, what we mean when we say um, urban conservation is, is the active management of natural resources and natural systems that deliver a wide array of benefits to protect biodiversity, benefits that enhance the well being of residents while um, ideally prioritizing under resourced, uh, underserved, and frontline communities. For the Conservancy, urban conservation really focuses on integrating nature based solutions within the functions of systems that cities rely on, such that we're able to uh, improve the lives of people in cities and um, protect nature for cities. We are expanding our presence, focusing on urban conservation and advancing resilience across Central Florida and right here in Orlando. And that's why I'm pleased to introduce our guest speaker, Chris Castro. Chris is the Director of Sustainability and Resilience at the City of Orlando. Chris, thank you so much for being here. Could you please tell us more about what the city of Orlando is um, working on? Most definitely. Thank you, Christiana. And on behalf of the city of Orlando, we are so excited about the Nature Conservancy opening up the city's metro program here in Orlando and collaborating on even more initiatives together. For a long time, the city of Orlando has held a high priority on sustainability. And dating back to 2007, our mayor, Buddy Dyer, launched the Greenworks Orlando Initiative with a vision to transform our city into one of the most environmentally friendly, socially equitable, and economically vibrant cities in America. We look at sustainability through the lens of several different areas, including clean energy, green buildings, local food systems, and of course, livability in our natural resources, uh, among many other topics. So as it relates to those efforts, it's also important to note that we have been working diligently to align our local priorities with the Global Sustainable Development Goals, or the SDGs. As you can see, there are several different uh, core goals that, that weave into nature-based solutions and the work that the Nature Conservancy uh, does as well, including Goal 15 of protecting life on land and Goal 14 of life below water, but many of those others that uh, weave in through our local priorities. And we're happy to share that later this, later this month, we'll be uh, publishing our first voluntary local review, an official report to the United Nations on how Orlando is advancing these global goals and doing our part. Now, as it relates to livability, we often look at this as the balance between the natural and the built environment. How do we continue to thrive as a community with, without compromising our environment and the wildlife that we live and work and learn and play around? And so as it relates to livability, we have really focused on it for a number of different areas. We, we have a goal of ensuring that every single resident is within a half mile or 10 minute walk from a green space or public park. And trees are so critical, not just for helping to sequester carbon and clean the air, but in addition to that, minimize the urban heat island effect, help to enhance wildlife uh, habitat and 
um, at the same time and improve the connection that we have with the natural world. So a couple of really important things to share. One is Orlando is home to a world renowned wetland called the Orlando Wetlands Park. It's 1,600 acres that the city of Orlando purchased and re-engineered to help clean uh, tertiary treated wastewater before it enters back into the natural environment. This is a world renowned birding sanctuary, tremendous amount of wildlife, and it helps to also clean the water uh, and purify it cleaner than actually the river itself. And so we're, we're excited to be able to show how green infrastructure could be utilized to find that balance. In addition, we do a lot to enhance the urban forest and our tree canopy coverage. We have a goal of seeing 40% tree canopy by the year of 2040 to ensure that we have an, uh, a very uh, a robust uh, urban forest. And we have a program called the Street Tree Program where every resident has the ability of landing uh, a number of trees in the city right of way free of charge. Uh, we come out and we actually professionally plant these trees and they're mature, usually four to eight uh, inch caliber trees uh, that uh, can help us to continue to enhance that tree canopy. In addition, we have a really unique program called the Energy Saving Trees Program, uh, where residents can actually, in, in addition to the public trees and the public right of way, they can get free trees every season to be planting in their backyard, as an example, in their private property. Uh, this is a partnership with the Arbor Day Foundation where we've been able to develop a tool that allows individuals to use almost like a Google mapping interface to drag and drop trees around their property and actually go through the process of delivering that tree to their door. And since 2015, we've done over 11,000 trees all around the city, uh, providing residents with access to fruit trees and other you know, native, uh, native plants here within the city. I also want to highlight that we have been doing our part to ensure that uh, we're a wildlife habitat community and in partnership with the National Wildlife Federation have been certified as a community wildlife habitat city in terms of the work that we're doing to help uh, help animals and wildlife find shelter, food, places to raise their young and of course places to eat. And uh, right now around Orlando, over 300 of our residents have individually gone through the NWF Wildlife Habitat certification for their own homes and their own properties uh, and ensuring that we're doing our part. And speaking of um, that wildlife, pollinators being a big part of that, we've, we've also joined the Monarch Pledge in ensuring that we're doing everything to enhance pollinators, butterflies, bees, and other really important insect species that we depend on every single day. Um, in closing, I did want to give you all a heads up that we've partnered with the Orlando Science Center and the Orlando Utilities Commission to create a living laboratory exhibit at the Orlando Science Center. This is now in Lock Haven Park and it's up and running. It was launched last uh, in, in February of 2021. Uh, but this is an opportunity for you to, to come and uh, look at this tiny green home and learn how to incorporate Greenworks into your home every single day. So we're so excited to be able to add um, our next partnership with the Nature Conservancy, and that is encouraging you all to participate in the City Nature Challenge. And I'll turn it back over to Christiana to talk through about what City Nature Challenge is all about. Yes, there is some great collaboration happening between the Nature Conservancy and the City of Orlando. Uh, TNC is hosting the City Nature Challenge 2021 in the Orlando metro area for the very first time with a group of community partners that many of you will recognize. Uh, this includes, of course, the City of Orlando, uh, Orange County, uh, Orlando Science Center, uh, Full Sail University, University of Central Florida, and many other um, organizations. The City Nature Challenge is an international effort for people to find uh, and document plants and wildlife in cities across the world. City Nature Challenge was started in 2016 by the community science teams at the Natural History Museum of Los Angeles and the California Academy of Sciences. Um, it was started as a fun way for both cities to capitalize on their friendly rivalry and host a community science event around urban biodiversity. Uh, through some friendly competition, um, we are connecting people to local nature in their cities. And uh, uh, we're also increasing awareness 
around urban conservation. Uh, here in the Orlando metro area, the City Nature Challenge is, is taking place, uh, uh, plants and wildlife observations and recordings across Orange County will, will, be, it will be identified, uh, will be recorded, and um, we will be competing, a friendly competition really, with other counties across the state of Florida. We are excited about the City Nature Challenge and uh, since it's organized on a global scale by uh, the California Academy of Sciences and the uh, Natural History Museum of Los Angeles. Uh, we will be joining over 300 global cities around the world to participate in the City Nature Challenge on starting from April 30th all the way to May 3rd, 2021. That's in, a, in, a, in, in, in a less, than, less than two weeks away. So we, we have a, put a link in the chat for the City Day, uh, Nature Challenge taking place in the Orlando Metro, so you can sign up if you're interested. Um, you can also explore other projects around the world. Well, I have to mention, highlight, that the City Nature Challenge, that the, the, that the observations and, and records of, of, of wildlife across Orange County is done using the iNaturalist app. This app is really easy to download through the Google uh, Play Store or the App Store. And you can also go to the website, the iNaturalist.org website, and, and create an account and start um, recording your own observations of wildlife in your urban spaces and green spaces in your city. I bet, I bet you have signed up already, Chris, and you probably are looking forward to to the City Nature Challenge participate in. I am so excited about the City Nature Challenge because often in cities, we're trying to figure out creative ways to engage our residents. And this City Nature Challenge allows us to go outdoors with our families, with our friends, visit a local park, visit a local trail system, or even just go in your backyard and begin to document the biodiversity that we live among. I mean, this is a true citizen science opportunity to use our smartphones and go out. And we're going to be using the iNaturalist app, which has artificial and AI kind of engine behind it. So when you use your phone camera, you can actually document exactly the species that you're looking at, and that can help pin on a map and begin to look at the biodiversity across our entire city. Uh, this is a tremendous opportunity. I certainly have signed up. We're already excited to go with my family to a couple of different parks and really document the birds, the animals, the insects, the plant species, and help us to better understand, uh, again, what we're living amongst. And, and um, so very excited to partner with the Nature Conservancy. Thank you all for the collaboration. And uh, we look forward to getting our residents and visitors to come and take action. Yes, it is important work, and we're quite excited about our collaboration with the city of Orlando, as well as other community partners. Um, we are um, looking forward to the event, and, um, and because all the data and information that will be collected, which is really important, will help to guide and inform our work in the Orlando metro area as we um, develop you know the 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 shape as we shape our work uh, in this space thank you very much chris for sharing your work um, sharing your knowledge and passion with us today and thank you again everyone for for joining us have a good one everybody goodbye hurricane season runs from june 1 until november 30th with most atlantic hurricanes occurring in august september and october when ocean temperatures are warmest if you examine storm statistics, you can see that 81 to 82 degree water is associated with category one and two hurricanes, while 84 degree water is associated with category four and five hurricanes. When we look at costs associated with hurricane damages, we see that the stronger the storm, the more every US taxpayer pays to clean it up. The U.S. government has been in the cleanup business since Hurricane Katrina and hasn't looked back, adding another $10.8 billion over the past two years. While cleanup is good news for local residents, this habit is becoming more and more expensive as damages from storms increase year after year. We can't fix the issue overnight. We can, however, use our individual power to make changes and to support policy that reduces greenhouse gas emissions. These are the emissions that cause unprecedented ocean warming. Learn more at volafoundation.org.
The work that we do now, we may not realize, even during our lifetime, the important impact of it. I was skeptical myself. As a data scientist, I always have to crunch numbers myself before I believe scientists. And when I dove into the numbers on climate change, uh, they were pretty alarming. We care about it because what seems like a relatively small change is actually an enormous amount of extra heat. And that extra heat is weighting the dice against us. At Volo Foundation, we recognize students. They are the driving force behind developing the solutions needed in order to take action in the fight against climate change. Volo Foundation Vista Award is a recognition specific for students who display leadership in developing climate solutions in parallel with five principles, vision, innovation, sustainability, technology, and adaptation. I'm joined by Nadia, a Vista Award finalist. Welcome, Nadia. Congratulations on being a finalist. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me, Thais. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Sure, yes. Um, so I am a PhD candidate at Florida International University. Uh, my uh, PhD is in Earth System Science, so I'm in the Department of Earth and Environment. I have been studying climate migration, uh, specifically within Miami-Dade County, for the past three years. Okay, and what about your VISTA project? Tell us a little bit about that. Yes, thank you. Um, so for the project that I submitted for the VISTA Award, I, uh, like I said, I'm studying uh, climate migration in Miami. And when I, uh, so just a little bit more background on me, I moved to Miami in 2012, and then I left in 2015, and I came back again in 2019 to pick up my PhD. Um, and around that time, I noticed a huge shift in the way that we spoke about sea level rise and the attention that it was garnering within the county uh, of Miami-Dade, within the city, uh, amongst residents, the way that people spoke about uh, potentially needing to maybe move from areas of high risk or even um, being displaced from their homes, those, those residents who were living in safer inland areas. And so I tried to make sense of everything uh, uh, th that I saw. I went to lots of community meetings. I spoke with residents, uh, leaders in, in, uh, in Miami-Dade. And what I ended up coming up with is what I'm calling the climate mobility framework. It is an integrated approach to trying to understand how sea level rise may prompt adaptation and migration uh, in different communities and how communities might respond differently based on their exposure to sea level rise and how vulnerable they are. Throughout uh, the literature, we have a lot of examples on how disasters disproportionately affect people. Hurricane Katrina being one of the most uh, prominent examples out there. And so I took a look through the literature and I wanted to figure out whether or not there were any patterns that we could to kind of maybe predict or at least say something about the ways in which people will be disproportionately affected by sea level rise if there is an appropriate government intervention. That's amazing. I think your project is an important step in creating a solution that could help millions of people combat the effects of climate change, especially in Florida. So with that said, I'm excited to announce that you are the winner of the 2021 Visa Award. <laughs> oh, wow. Thank you. I didn't expect that. Congratulations. <laughs> Thank you so much, Chase. I very much appreciate this. Um, the, uh, what I'm hoping to use this award uh, money for is to convert what I've found, the data that I've crunched, the maps that I've made, and make a web tool from it. Um, that web tool, I hope, will be very influential in, um, in, in helping decision makers make very important decisions uh, regarding adaptation. Well, we're very proud of the work you're doing and the positive impact that you're having in the world. Uh, that's what we want to see from the generations right now at school and the generations to come. Uh, together we're better. And what I want to say is please keep us updated. $10,000 that uh, I hope help you a lot and keep us updated on the progress of your project as you continue to carry out this important work. Congratulations again. Thank you. I most certainly will keep you updated. Thank you so much for this opportunity. On behalf of Volo Foundation and all of our speakers, we thank you for taking part in climate correction. Although we are apart, 
We are all in this together, and we have a tremendous opportunity to implement the solutions available to create a more renewable, sustainable future. We hope that you feel empowered with the information you have learned this week and urge you to take action in your communities and make your voices heard. We invite you to visit our website, volofoundation.org, and to connect with us on social media and share what you have learned and how you're going to take action for the environment. It is only with your help that we will be able to bring about impactful change to protect the planet for generations to come. We encourage you to use the knowledge you have gained about the impact of climate change and be a part of the solution by taking action today. Thank you for joining us for Climate Correction 2021. We will see you next year.